so it is six o'clock. I'd like to call a meeting to order. Uh, and right off the bat, we've got uh, our usual uh, administrative uh, work. So uh, I'd entertain any uh, additions or changes to the agenda uh, anticipated. No? Okay, uh, great. Um, so approval of the minutes uh, before September 9th. Uh, has everybody had the opportunity to review those uh, minutes? Yes, I just had one little correction. Okay. In the discussion of the Moscow Woods Bridge Repair Plan, oh, where's oh, oh, oh. Team's uh, doing it. Okay, great. <laughs> just in total the last, uh, the end of that discussion, um, it's on page two, I think, three. Um, it just says that the Friends of the Winooski are trying to coordinate their into this into their project of getting the bridge taken down, and I'm pretty sure the Friends that should be the dam. are taking the dam down. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually rewrote that sentence a little bit to say Friends of Winooski are trying to coordinate the bridge repair and replacement project with the dam deconstruction project. That's being better. That would be better. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Uh, uh, were there any other uh, adjustments uh, that need to be discussed? So with that, I'll uh, entertain a motion to accept them as presented with the additions uh, proposed by Anne or prepared by Anne, um, which will be integrated uh, after afterwards. Does that sound good? Yes. So, so second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No? Okay. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. That came up as I was rereading those. Is somebody taking responsibility? We decided we're going to appoint a monitor for the erosion control. Is somebody keeping track of all that? Because that will come up in March when we start appointing people. I don't oh. want to lose it. You remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, I remember. Right. I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking it was going to be an official you know, position that would be. Well, it was, we talked about doing yeah. sort of the way but, but there's a reason we should add it to the yeah, list. So. Just to make sure that we do it. Yeah, um, I'll take that one. Another one for Cardi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I'll uh, entertain a motion to uh, accept the board orders. So move. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? No. <clears throat> uh, and approval of the annual Friends of Callis and Town Hall Management uh, Agreement, um, which um, my understanding and read is that there aren't really any changes from last year. This is an annual uh, agreement that we renew every year. Um, Cliff, can speak to it. Cliff, do you want to speak to that? Uh, sure. Hi. How's everybody doing tonight? Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, just carrying over everything that we had from last year. Don't anticipate any need for changes. Um, I don't know if all the select board members have had a chance to review. I know some of you are familiar with it from years before. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm here to answer them. If not, uh, the friends, on behalf of the friends, we would certainly appreciate uh, renewal and moving forward with another year. And um, also want to talk a little bit briefly, if we have the time, um, with regards to plans that we have upcoming for the, the next year. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Sure. Well, just real quick. Um, a while back, the friends received a very generous donation from a private individual who prefers to remain anonymous. And the uh, intention of this uh, donation was to provide light and sound equipment for the upstairs. After looking for a while and uh, consulting with different companies, we believe that we have found a partner to work with um, and we're going to look to engage them and uh, add said equipment to the upstairs. But we didn't want to just, you know, bull ahead with all of this and not act without transparency. We wanted the uh, select board to be aware of what we were up to and what we were working on. And I um, was wondering if the select board would indulge us and uh, let us occasionally meet with Kari 
to uh, include him in the discussions, let him know what, what we're doing, and uh, more or less liaise with the select board uh, to pass along what we're working on. And then, uh, of course, the friends would gladly make ourselves available to the board should there be need to have an in-depth discussion over any of these plans. I, I think that is appropriate as long as Gary feels that, uh, that he has the bandwidth for, for that. Uh, I think that sounds like a great way to keep keep everybody in the loop about the projects as they roll forward. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of purchasing that equipment, I mean, that'll be property of the friends of the, of the hall. The hall, yeah. Exactly. Sir. Yeah. Um, and also, it kind of would dovetail nicely because it's my understanding that uh, Kari is now um, spearheading our effort, efforts for the MERP grant uh, monies, and uh, these discussions can definitely dovetail. Uh, what we imagine is doing this in two phases. The first phase is simply going to involve obtaining the equipment and being able to utilize it when uh, events occur that would utilize this equipment or have a need for this type of equipment. Uh, once we get into a remodel of the upstairs, then we can look at a more permanent installation um, of the equipment, should that be appropriate at that time. And I don't know if uh, any other members of the Friends are there. They might have something to add to this. Scott, I know you're there. Um, Artie was going to, who's been working on putting together the quotes that we got um, can provide more detail, but I don't believe he's arrived yet. Scott, do you have anything to add? I think you've said it very well, Cliff. Thank you. Um, if, uh, I, think, I think we probably will meet uh, formally and look at the proposal that, are, that already found and vote to uh, approve it and to spend that money then we'll have our hands on the equipment. Um, and I, I think there's enough electrical up there to use, use what we get right away. Um, but we certainly could use a, if when, when work comes through, we could use a electrical upgrade and insulation things to try to make it a little warmer up there. Um, exactly, and that's the point where we would uh, work um, with what happens with the, monies from the MERP grant uh, and try to make our efforts go in concert with that. Uh, in the interim, before any of that happens, part of our plan includes bringing in uh, Dan Cowan to evaluate the electrical uh, grid that's available upstairs, make sure it's going to support this equipment before we even engage. Right. So just wanted to make everyone aware of that. I don't know if there's any questions from the board or anyone uh, in the audience who wonders about this project. So Carol Beatty's here. She's with Friends I Live. <laughs> hey, Carol. Um, oh, yeah, that's something else to bring up. Uh, a side note, um, I also provided to Barbara, and I know she shared it with the board, uh, a brief summary in spreadsheet form of some of the activities of events that the Friends have scheduled at the Hall over the past couple of years. And uh, we would like to formally present our very first, uh, uh, what would they call it? It's as part of the management agreement, the friend agree, Friends agreed to give the town of Calais 20% of all revenues that are derived from rentals of the Hall. And we are now in a position to present the very first check um, that comes from some of those rentals. It's certainly not going to move the needle much in terms of the budget, but uh, it is nice to see that this uh, formal arrangement is actually coming into fruition. Carol? Yeah, I gave the check to Barbara when I came in. <laughs> Great. Okay. Now, yeah. David has to sit there as well. I could. <laughs> hey, David. Um, don't know if you have anything to add. The, the board appears to be on uh, on board, as it were, with our idea of uh, interacting with Kari um, with regards to the uh, AV project upstairs, um, and also our understanding that as the MERP grant uh, monies 
possibly become available, that we move into a second phase of integrating this equipment in line with that project as well. Um, so, David, I didn't know if you had anything else to add to that? Not if they're on board. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then don't say anything. <laughs> okay, well, great. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. I appreciate it. Um, and thanks for those representing the uh, the friends. That uh, that's a helpful update. I, I, and thanks for the check. And thank you. For the, <laughs> thank you for the check. Could, could I ask a question? Yes. I want to know a little more about the Merck brand. Is that going to be for the insulation? And... I was planning on talking about it during the. To you oh, for okay. tonight. Um, but yes, energy improvements is the Great. purpose. Great. Uh, so if there aren't any other questions about the agreement, uh, I entertain a motion to accept. Um, I said one thing, if, yeah. um, moving equipment. Is the equipment coming in and staying here or is it being moved in and out for a time? We imagine that uh, we it's doesn't take up a lot of space and uh, we imagine being able to store it in the little closet next to the stage upstairs. It's written into the management agreement that uh, we're allowed to uh, store some stuff there, but it's only with the blessing of the town office because they have first dibs on that storage space upstairs. If the need arose where it, it took up too much space and they couldn't store what they needed to there, we'd figure something else out. I don't believe the elevator was designed for freight. That's the only reason I'm bringing it up. We so, would not require the elevator for this. It's very explicit on the elevator that it's only for uh, using the moving of people up and down. You definitely don't move furniture, equipment, or anything like that on the elevator. We can certainly carry this equipment by hand up and down the stairs. So, so Cliff, whenever you guys are ready to put that in the closet, if you could schedule that either with Tegan or Marcel, because we wouldn't want it stored in front of our election supplies. <laughs> Absolutely. When I was discussing this uh, Friday at the meeting of the friends, I let them know that that was paramount, that it not interfere or be in the way of the town office's access to anything that's in that closet. We actually imagine being able to store these things in some small cases and put them off to the side in the back so they'll be completely out of your way. But yes, we will alert you before we do anything. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I actually may have a few more others, but uh, I, I think I'll save those. I imagine we're gonna be uh, meeting with the friends uh, as part of our Kind of budgeting prep will be on. We did that last year. Are they on our list to meet with? I think no. They're, the friends is it is is own five hundred one c three not for profit organization. They're not involved right. in the town budget at all. We okay. Did, we did meet with them at their request, but that wasn't part of the budget. It wasn't part of the same kind of window. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll table it. They, they don't need, need to be had. Uh, or yeah. questions need to be raised now. Yeah. I can certainly please appreciate. Okay. Um, so again, I'll, I'll entertain a, a motion to accept uh, the agreement and sign it. I guess that we're just looking for one signature, so we need to authorize. It's, it's, it's got five signatures. Five so signatures, five okay. Uh, so uh, a motion to accept and sign uh, the agreement with the town, the friends of the town hall. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks to the friends. Yeah, thank you, friends. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. David will sign on behalf of the friends, and uh, I anticipate being back in town soon, and at which point I'll swing by the office and sign it as well. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Take care. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Thanks, uh, so next up, we have uh, the authorization of Kari uh, to sign the fiscal year 2025 state uh, structures grant agreement, uh, which was in the folder. At, are there any questions about the structures grant as it's been presented? I don't think so. This is yeah, so was this, one this, yeah. Right. Yeah, this, yeah, we've seen this before. <laughs> so this is an updated yeah. um, so that we have more time to execute the project. And we'll We'll include a, an allocation for the budget. <coughs> so we'll be talking about this again, but just, just to get things going. Get it going. Uh, so I'll entertain a motion to approve. 
or authorized card. So moved. Uh, second. Oh, second. Sorry. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Thanks, Kerry. Um, and uh, the next up is uh, an approval to sign and a signature of the road grader bond certificate of uh, completion. And that's just a, a piece of paperwork saying that the paperwork has been uh, completed um, and will finalize the... Uh, uh, the Everything's done everything. except for paying Yeah, for exactly. So, um, and this is for the bond. This is for the bond. Yes. Yeah. Last time we see the new we really didn't need this, but I guess people it's need people process. People need what they need. Uh, so I I entertain a motion to approve and sign. Well, Kari signed. I signed as treasurer, but you'll need to sign. We'll need to sign as uh, as the select board. Okay. Okay. Second and second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No? All right. Thanks. Uh, we'll circulate that at the end of the meeting and get those signed. Um, and next up, we have a public comment period, uh, which uh, is set aside for 15 minutes. Um, is anybody here to talk about anything that does not already appear on the agenda? Yes, sir. Would you mind stating your name for? Sure. Uh, again. Hi, I'm Chris Andreessen. So um, I live on Haggett Road, and this is kind of about I have two two things I want to bring up. One, well, the first one's about perceptions. So last week, graders showed up and started at the co-op and worked up to Martin Road and stopped. And I'm like, but well, that's not all of Haggett Road. And actually, they went up Adamant and sprayed mag chloride. And I'm, so I contacted Carrie and said, what's up? Because here's, I mean, my perception is I live on Haggett. Every day I see school buses go by. And the worst section of Haggett Road is that little cut between Jim and Lorene's house and my house, it was rutted out. It's the narrowest part of the road, and I got no attention. My perception is we got school kids going in school buses, and the town doesn't care. That's a perception that I have. may not be accurate, but it's one that could be drawn from the fact that the road crew just left it. On the positive side, I had communications with Kari, and they actually came and graded today, and then, uh, but they didn't do any ditch work, but they graded. <laughs> and then they came back later and sprayed mag chloride. Um, but clearly that section, and we've had this discussion before in this very room about that section being forgotten, that it's actually part of the town. Um, and as I said, my perception is I see these school buses with our kids going by, and it's the worst section of the road, and it's, it's we're getting no attention until it seems like I said, hey, what's going on? Um, and then the other piece that I wanted to bring up is uh, mud season. It was really nice when Kari was sending out or posting on the forum, what's going on with the roads? And uh, roads are pretty important. <laughs> um, and it just seems from my perspective that it might be nice to have those going year round, to take an extra five minutes once a week and say, okay, this is what's on the docket for a road crew getting out and attending to roads here and ditches here and culverts. Um, so, because I have no idea what's going on in the rest of the town. I just have my little view and I drive around. Um, very little other than Center Road and hang it out to Canada. I mean, I don't cruise around a lot. So anyways, that would be a suggestion that uh, there be uh, some 
I have better communication around what's going on with the roads and the crews. I, mean, I know they're flat out and busy. It'd just be nice to know how they're busy. Yeah, I, I, Chris, I appreciate you registering those uh, concerns. I, the, I've been paying attention to the kind of dialogue around uh, Haggard over the last couple of weeks, and um, and that was kind of the first thing that struck struck me. I mean, there certainly hasn't been any deliberate effort to uh, to avoid or neglect any any segment of town, and we have certainly an obligation to address uh, or address all the roads at some point, um, and we do. We've had a fair amount of turnover, particularly for those who, uh, who do the grading in the last two years. Um, so there's uh, there's in part a learning uh, learning curve. But what what did strike me as something that I think would be really helpful um, for the community, uh, not only that we can we can do it, is, is being more transparent about what the grading schedule uh, looks like. Um, yeah, or or mowing, you know, because they become like yeah. mow. So the specifics of doing or standing something like that uh, haven't unfolded quite yet. Uh, but we we do have a new mapping resource that we've been kind of curious about whether or not we can integrate that with the website in a particular way. Um, and so there's that that's certainly on on my radar and and, and on the list of uh, things to discuss and. Um, uh, more recently, we've, we've been talking about maybe assigning somebody with the responsibility of trying to keep some of those digital pieces of uh, information up to date throughout the year because it was so helpful um, through flooding events and even through the mud season that we had, uh, mud seasons that, we, <laughs> that we've been having. Um, uh, so. I thank you for bringing that up and thank you for the patience. Um, has the whole section of Haggard Road been uh, ingraded at this point? I believe all so. All the way through? Chris, they got it all? Yeah, yeah, they, they, they <laughs> actually went a little bit into next town. <laughs> 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 I, think, I think they just missed it this year. That probably won't happen again. <laughs> I mean, it's a special trip out. In general, I, you know, I've been really impressed with the grading. I don't know why it's stood out to me more this year than other years. Um, there seems to have been a lighter, a lighter touch where it needs a lighter touch and heavier touches to reestablish road, uh, road grades in a really nice way. Um, but I, I have felt like it's, there's a lot of ambiguity about like what, what's being graded and when. Um, and frankly, certainly during the, the busing uh, season, it, that information would be helpful. So. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know if if bus routes are prioritized I can't for, speak to for road maintenance or plowing in the wintertime. I mean, I oh, definitely plowing. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, creating, I would say we're just trying to get everything. Um, and, you know, a couple times at least a year. Right. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say the bus is being prioritized unless it's in bad shape. Yeah. But anyway, about the point about updates, it just hasn't been top of mind recently. I can certainly make more of an effort. So, but Jordan, were you saying we have the, we're thinking about putting that on the website as opposed to having front porch forum stuff? Uh, well, it could be either. I mean, I, I've just had a, a couple of conversations with the uh, kind of the robustness of the new mapping system that we have. We, um, the one that was the, the mapping resource that was kind of stood up for the emergency response two years ago was the one that we were that we reused again for uh, this mud season. Um, it, it's kind of an unofficial resource uh, to a certain extent, um, and it kind of relies on a volunteer um, and her expertise uh, to keep it up to date um, uh, to a certain extent. Um, so as we were thinking about, well, that was a really nice thing to have. Is this something that we could put on, on the website or integrate into the website? Um, and, and we can likely do something like that, but it, it'll require some more work. Yeah. Um, and we may be able to use this other resource for that uh, in a more streamlined fashion. Um, <clears throat> so that was the extent of that. It's not anything in particular at the moment, but it's on, on the list of 
things that we can add uh, and add to the town website. Okay. Uh, are there any other comments uh, other than Chris's? We'll save the rest for the agenda items as they come through. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm struggling with my voice. Uh, the use of right-of-way uh, for uh, George Road. Um, so this is a uh, application uh, to, to perform work in the right-of-way uh, for a water line uh, that will be crossing George Road. Has everybody had the opportunity to review that application? Uh, and are there any questions? Is there anybody here representing that? Well, Eden Nunn is the landowner, and Jordan Hepper is the project manager. I yeah. strongly suggested that they be here tonight. Okay. I assume, but I don't see them. I also asked for you know the dimensions on the on the drawing, and was told they would get it. But anyway, um, we have reviewed the the site. The, site. And, um, the, the only condition would be the, the typical four feet of depth at least. Yeah. And that that was why they proposed uh, an option B in case they find that they can't reach that depth with uh, option A, um, which would be their preference because it's the straight, straightest, shortest path. And this is a, a seasonal water line that yes. is going to service an agricultural building? Yeah, that's right. Um, I did they start date uh, that they were trying to get it done? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm not sure about that. <clears throat> Did they provide any information about, um, is there going to be a point where they're going to have to actually stop traffic because they're digging a trench across the road? Yeah, I think it was a, they know, put on? it was less than a day. It was a matter of you know, hours. Mm -hmm. I thought that would happen. Uh -huh, uh huh. And so, is there some provision for diverting? Where is it? Remind me. It's not on George Road. It's on. No, it is on George. It's on George Road. Yeah. yeah. Is there a problem? Does do people need to be told to go around if it's going to be a couple of hours? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly how to evaluate that. Um, Remember when we did Lewis Porter's? He actually put signs out. At, at the beginning and end of Martin Road, just to tell people that it would be closed for these four hours or whatever okay. it was. Okay. And I think the road crew helped them a little bit with that. Okay. So that could be a condition as appropriate warning. Signage. Yeah. It, yeah, because you can go around. If it were a heavily trafficked road, we could even set up an alert, you know, through the state. I don't think that's really necessary. It wouldn't hurt to put something on front porch forum, yeah. you know, a day or two ahead so people know. Yeah, certainly. Um, so with the additions of those conditions, uh, is it possible to uh, entertain a conditional approval? And I guess my, my conditional approval would be on uh, the documentation of uh, of, uh, of the <laughs> of the feet from their the center line of their uh, curb cut, their yep. driveway. Um, you know, that's something that I've been harping on quite a bit. This application does ask for those delineations, yeah. you know, those, those feet to be noted, and um, the, there's kind of sparse detail while it was fairly well represented like on, by Landmark. Uh, we. We really need to be documenting where these things are being buried in the roads. Um, so if they can get that information added to their drawing, um, then, then we can proceed, <laughs> I guess. So that would be my condition, is that you want to see it before, before, before the work is performed. I want to make sure that those, that those are added on there. And maybe start getting a little, a little more direct about making sure that that's a requirement. Okay. But in terms of the application itself, John looked at it and has no problems with it. Correct. So I yeah, okay. yeah. It's similar to the power line. It's going to be super bad. Yeah. Uh, so uh, with that, I guess that's a conditional approval uh, of the uh, uh, entertaining a motion to conditionally approve 
relative to the additions of uh, signage um, and uh, posting about road closure um, on George Road uh, to go on front porch for him prior to work commencing, um, and also the submission of um, uh, linear dimensions from the center line of the driveway uh, to the drawing that was submitted before work commences. I would say sufficient to... Yeah, sufficient to locate. Locate, uh, for the town to locate where the... Where the... Infrastructure. Water line is going to be run. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kari. Yeah. Uh, so if everybody uh, agrees with that, uh, so I'll entertain a motion. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? Yes. No. Uh, moving to the Moscow Woods Bridge Repair Award. Um, so we have a proposal to repair the bridge to review um, and a uh, potential action of uh, accepting a proposal under an emergency repair uh, or as an emergency repair. Um, so we so talked about this a couple yeah. times in the past few months. Reminder that engineer has been recommending full replacement of this bridge for, right. for quite some time. We have chosen a path to do a temporary repair until we can line up the funding for a full replacement. Um, we were awarded this particular grant that helped pay for this back in 22, and it expires in December, so that's why we're considering thinking about this as an emergency situation. We've gotten one bid. The contractor says they can get it done in October or November, so that's, that's good. That's really good news. Um, the grant is 90% uh, of uh, 10% match from the town with a $90,000 maximum. So we'll come in well below that. We've already spent about $7,000 on design. Um, so, um, yeah, so definitely recommending approval so we can get this work done and access the grant. And it would need, since we only have the one bid, it would be needed to be done under the emergency provision of the purchasing policy. It's for, is it for footings? Um, was it, it said for things breaks. were going to be galvanized, delivered, and installed. Yeah, to, just to, to reinforce, what, I forget the name of the term, but the, the base of the bridge. Uh, okay. Yes. And uh, no Toby problem. looked at what they're planning, and it looks satisfactory? Yeah, it's based on the, our engineer's design. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So who, had, who had done the more extensive repair, and then we asked for, uh, right. you know, what's the short-term repair that will get us through. And how, how long will this supposedly last? Sorry? It's a temporary emergency repair. How long will it be? It'll last until... I think, it, I think we're in the neighborhood of five years okay. as opposed to, you know, okay. we're looking at the 20. Will we have to close the bridge while they're doing it? I don't know. That's a good question. Mm. And if so, for how long? <laughs> that's that's I'll, the nature. I'll certainly find that out as part of the execution of the project. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like it would be most appropriate to uh, consider this as two separate motions. Is okay. that right? Uh, a would we have to kind of make a declaration of it being an emergency situation um, and uh, and then uh, make a decision on uh, accepting the single uh, bid that we uh, that we received for the work um, does that sound accurate right yeah, I think that's well, cool. can we just say so we, we're making a finding that um, we are it's in Mm -hmm. or maybe you have the wording. Do you I don't. No, I don't have the word. Okay, let me see. We, the, the select board finds that um, this is an emergency situation because the Moscow Woods Road is in need of immediate repair, but we're unable to do a permanent repair. Uh, uh, we're, uh, therefore, yeah. we, we declare this an emergency and we accept the bid for $20,000. You may have to start that again. I'm not Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Uh, 
Well, is there some ordinance language that tells us what we have to find? But it's in our purchasing. Uh, it's a state. It's our rules. It's our rules. It's our purchasing policy. It's our purchasing policy. Uh, policy. Um, purchasing policy requires what? I, I, I think it's a, a finding of. Uh, I have funds that this project is eligible to be counted as an emergency situation because the bridge is in need of immediate repair, yeah. but. And then I lost it. Uh, uh, I would say that it qualifies for an emergency purchase yeah. under yes. our purchasing policy. Okay. And you don't have to put this in minutes, but because a delay in such repair would endanger persons or property. And that's, it, that's what the policy, policy says. It does. Uh, so a motion uh, to accept that finding, <laughs> I guess. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? No. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll entertain a motion to accept the, uh, the proposal to uh, uh, perform the repair. I move to accept the bid. And authorize, do we have to sign it? Does somebody have to sign it? Authorize the car to sign it? I forget what I wrote. Um, Yeah, that's an author session for the prior slide. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So a motion to uh, <clears throat> accept the uh, bid that was received for the repair uh, for the total of uh, twenty thousand. What was the eight hundred? I believe eight hundred. Thank you. Uh, and uh, five hundred and eighty. Five hundred twenty thousand five hundred and eighty. Increase my font size. <laughs> Isn't that right? But yes. Yeah. Yes, you are. You are right. And authorization uh, for Kari to sign it uh, and accept the bid. Has that been moved? No. Okay. Here, I'll do it then. A the second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and moving forward to the Planning Commission, uh, we're a little ahead of schedule. Oh, we have a question from David. Yeah, do you have the name of the contractor? Yeah, it's uh... DMS Manufacturing and Fabrication. Okay, thank you. Oh, machining, sorry, machining and fabrication. Yeah. Machining. All right. Um, Rachel? Yep. Would you like to come to the front row? Can I talk to you in the back of the room? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just make it a little easier for those on Zoom to yeah. pick up the conversation. Um, so tonight uh, we'll be uh, reviewing uh, a portion of the town plan, uh, specifically on uh, a discussion about the, the housing segment of the town plan. So uh, we've been kind of systematically uh, working our way through with the Planning Commission to, to review draft additions uh, or draft segments of the town plan in, in preparation for uh, considering and accepting the entire revision and this has been I think working out pretty well a nice way to work through the conversations in part um, and so tonight we've scheduled time to uh, to go through that uh, with uh, with Rachel so um, would you like to start with a, a, an intro or a 30,000 foot view intro I can do that I'll actually I won't start with the document let me just kind of back up even further because sure. A lot of what this is going to be about is what's about developing housing in our town and housing that is affordable. And I know that we've had some conversations with folks who've come to the Planning Commission, and I think there have been conversations here about what do we mean by affordable housing and when is housing affordable. 
So I just want to kind of level set a little bit on that concept before I jump into what we've actually drafted. Mm -hmm. So historically, housing has been considered affordable if a household pays less than one third of their income, their gross income, on housing. And in Vermont, we have subsidized housing, and we have what I would call capital letters affordable housing, right? So subsidized housing is for low-income folks, this or older people or people with disabilities. And generally, it means that their income is going to be below 60% of the area median income, or even lower than that. Um, and in those situations, the tenant generally pays less than, this is almost exclusively rental, less than 30% of their income goes to rent, up to 30%. And then they have what we now call a housing choice voucher, what people used to call Section 8, and that's what pays the rest. If those are operating in Calus, those would be through the Vermont State Housing Authority. That would be our housing authority. Um, and so most people are using those to rent a market rent apartment or home. Then we have affordable housing. And there are both rental and home ownership affordable housing opportunities in Vermont. Um, these are market units, or would be market units, but they are offered below market rate, generally because there have been some kinds of investments in them, low-income housing tax credits, home tax credits, other kinds of federal investments that make them able to be sold, sold or rented below market rate. And these will also still have income limits, uh, but they tend to be higher. It might be somewhere between 80% of area median income all the way up to potentially 120% of area median income. And for that, downstreet is the local community trust. They are the ones that now are managing the apartments at the East Calus General Store. And those would be considered um, low-income housing at this point. Um, so that's kind of, I wanted to just kind of level set. So when I'm talking about housing that's affordable, I'm talking about housing where the people living there are paying less than one-third of their income, or up to one-third of their income, on that housing. And when I'm talking about affordable housing, I'm talking about housing that has those kinds of investments in it. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. So um, jumping into the housing section, hopefully you all got a copy of our current draft. Yes, OK, great. So we've kind of kept the basic structure that we've had in this section in the past and cut some things and added some things. And I think that's what we've done in most sections. So in terms of current conditions, we do now have previously like three village districts. We now have four village districts. So East Callis, North Callis, Maple Corner, and Adamant are all categorized now as village districts. Um, and then we have some background data. Um, right now, what's in here is census data. Uh, John McCall was able to give me the listers information in terms of how they have counted the number of houses. I think that's going to be more accurate. It's also lower than these numbers from the census in terms of the number of total homes in our town. Um, so that will change a little bit. Um, I can actually give you, I can tell you, that right now, oh, that's the wrong. Right now, they have uh, 318 houses categorized as residential, more than five acres. 387 categorized as residential, less than five acres. 33 landed mobile homes, one remaining unlanded mobile home. 73 seasonal homes with more than five acres and 14 seasonal homes with less than five acres. Although John did say that some of those seasonal homes may actually be capable of year-round use. They're just not used year-round currently. So that gets us to a total of 826 residential units, which is quite a bit lower than what the census thinks we have at 807. Uh, that, that includes the 87 seasonal. That includes the seasonal. And the vacant housing unit? So we think the reason the vacant housing units are so high for the census is because they put the seasonal houses into the vacant units. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I so I've added in here some updated information from the, for the every five-ish years for my housing needs assessment. Uh, and so you'll see a couple of spots where we still have some red lining. That's kind of newer information. We haven't completely vetted it yet. Um, the median value of our homes has gone up pretty significantly um, from the 2010 to 2020 census. By, uh, the median has gone up $88,400 in 10 years. Um, we are able to pull from the census their estimates of um, folks who are paying um, more than a third of their income on mortgage and less than a third. Um, so um, combining households both with and without uh, mortgages, about 25% of our homeowners are considered housing burden according to the census. So they're paying 30% or more of their total incomes towards their housing costs. On the rental side, the median rent according to the census and I just keep saying according to the census because it, their accuracy is, they have big margins of error for a town of our size. Um, but they say that our median rent is $1,195. Um, and approximately 26% of our renters were estimated to be paying between $2,000 and $2,500 of rent per month in our town. Mm -hmm. So that would indicate that 60% of folks in Calus who are renting are either rent burdens or they're paying more than 30% or severely rent burdened. They're paying more than half their income towards their housing costs. And we have challenges that we are dealing with that are contributing to these rising housing costs. There is, of course, a statewide housing shortage. Um, and VH VHFA's housing needs assessment estimates that Washington County will need between 2,289 and 3,385 homes um, between 2025 and 2029 to meet the need that we have. Um, and that includes resolving homelessness as well as having the capacity for other folks to move to our community um, and to reduce the vacancy rate so that we have a healthier housing market. So generally, Calus is 2.8% of Washington County. That would mean adding between 64 and 95 homes in Calus. A year. Total for over those next five years. So that would be 19 homes a year, which is significantly more than we have <laughs> two per year we are currently adding. Yeah. Okay. Um, across the state, short-term rentals are impacting vacancy rates. That doesn't seem to have been something that has significantly changed in Calus, although we certainly do have some homes that are listed for short-term rentals in our town. Uh, and homelessness really has exploded in our county, um, or at least our ability to know how many people are homeless has exploded in our county. Um, so. 446 individuals were identified as homeless during 2023's point in time count. So every January, one night a year, every people volunteer, they go out and count all the homeless people in our area. So 446 in 2023, 963 a year later. And because of changes at the state level in terms of programs to serve homeless people, um, more folks are getting kicked out of being sheltered homeless and are becoming unsheltered homeless as we speak. Um, so that is more dangerous, more likely to increase our health care costs, all sorts of different things. Um, so cost of housing is a challenge. The overall housing crisis is a challenge. The workforce and supply chain in order to develop new housing is a challenge. And regulatory requirements can be challenges as well um, in terms of developing housing. So a lot of our previous town plan was focused on updating our zoning ordinance in order to 
um, address some of these issues. That's done. We have updated our zoning ordinance. So we have a chart in here that I put together that shows what kinds of housing are permitted uses or conditional uses depending on which zoning district folks are in. Um, and it's, since that only was approved in, at the March town meeting, it's a little early to say if that is having any impact on development in Calais. Um, so if you go down to the goals section, which I feel like is kind of the key part of each of these sections we have, if we want to be part of the solution of solving the housing crisis here in Calais, that would mean adding up to 19 net units of housing each year. And based on our experience of just like having people develop housing because they buy land and want to move in, that's not going to happen. Um, and so the goal that I proposed here is that we engage landowners, private developers, and in particular affordable housing developers um, in order to find the places where we could develop up to 19 units of housing each year. Um, I think that would also involve the select board, the emergency management committee, the planning commission, working with the regional planning commission or some other outside expert to identify how our flood resilience needs and our housing sector need to come together to find the right spots to be able to develop some housing. Um, and I th think that it's possible that we will find that it will be difficult to continue develop in developing in our village centers. Um, and so consideration of whether we need to create a new village center, village district or a new town center may be something that needs to be on the table if we want to continue to have kind of the densely packed village and then sparsely impacted out lying areas. Or, or expand them. There are a couple of areas in the, uh, in the state where, you know, relative to yeah. the Act 250 changes, they, you know, rather than like a, a village center that had been defined in a particular uh, historic main street yes. uh, in a small town, but, um, but didn't necessarily expand outside that very much. They've expanded along yeah. the corridor to yeah. help kind of promote more. Yeah, and so I think looking at whether the <coughs> area that counts for each of our village centers is still the right area or if those should be expanded, right. that's part of that consideration. And I just think because of the flooding we've experienced, we have to look at it with yeah. that lens as well. For sure. Excuse me, your goal number one says add 95 net units per year. I think you said We have an outdated no. version. It's 95 over the next five years, so 19 per year is what that would That's what you're about today, so okay. Okay. It should be 19. All right. It should be 19. Uh, Rachel, do you want us to interrupt as you're talking? Should we wait till you're done? I am no, just we'll about done. Yeah. <laughs> we'll wait. So the other goals here really are around um, looking at are there local incentives we can provide for accessory dwelling units and, ex and development of two family or multi family units, um, whether that is through connecting folks up with the Vermont rental. Uh, program that lets people do rehabs of property to get them online as rentals or something that we do more locally. Um, and then last is to engage with our legislators to address the statewide policy changes that we may need in order to be part of the solution to the housing crisis. So those are the goals that we've identified <laughs> at this point um, and I would love feedback uh, both on kind of the background information as well as the potential goals we have here. Thank you, Rachel. Um, right, right off the bat, I think um, I really appreciate the effort to work with uh, with the zoning administrator um, to try to get the the data of Calis um, because that, that has long been kind of a, a frustration of mine is that the data that is driven by just census data is just really not that accurate. The margin for error is so high. And, um, and I think it would be great if we could commit ourselves as a community to tracking those numbers uh, a little more internally. And I don't think it would be very difficult. Um, yeah, John was actually able to give me the, the sheets 
from 2013 to this year. That's correct. Awesome. So now we'll have a chart in there that shows those patterns and the time. Um, and I can turn those into graphs, too, if people prefer graphs over charts. I think that's really, really helpful um, and, and really relevant context to be yeah. uh, for, for folks to be looking at um, in, the, in the community. Um, so thank you. Uh, I have some others, other comments, but I'll save those if, uh, if others want to ask some questions. Um, I love these goals, but who's, I mean, really, how's it going to happen? Is that, do you have thoughts about an action plan short of Gus Seeley quitting his job? And yeah, I don't think Gus Seeley quitting his job, nor am I. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think that's a great question, and it's something that we've been wrestling with on the planning commission. Uh, is, uh, do we identify, like, in the past, we've identified who's responsible for achieving these goals, and then we still don't achieve these goals, and there's not really an accountability method. Sure. So we've kind of been pulling that out. But in terms of like how I actually think we can achieve these goals, I think that in housing, this may actually be a place where the planning commission and the select board are kind of uniquely suited to partner up in terms of, for example, inviting someone from downstreet out here to talk to us about what are the opportunities in Calus that we could be working with them on. Um, or, you know, being more engaged with Vermont State Housing Authority, I don't have any idea, I don't know if there are any people using housing choice vouchers in Calus, but I do know we have incredibly red burdened tenants. And so how can we make sure that those folks are on the list? We have a town services officer, um, or we're supposed to. <laughs> Um, how are we making sure those people are on the wait list? So, you know, they may be on the wait list for 5, 10, 15 years, depending on what priority they fit, fit under, but I'd rather those folks be on the wait list and not be on the wait list. Well, and so I think that, that to kind of circle back and pull on that thread a little bit, because yeah. you, you had raised the question of whether or not we want to maybe look at doing this on the local level and yeah. try to figure out these incentives on a more local level, or do we just want to be more active and vocal at trying to pull state resources through? And, and yeah. in my limited, somewhat limited, I guess, experience, I think those state resources are, are amazing. Um, the need is significant across the state, so it, they're very competitive, and the wait lists are very long. Um, and so, and they also generally come with obligations uh, to for qualification that can be challenging. So, if you apply for a grant that helps rehabilitate an energy inefficient house. Um, that's great as a, as a homeowner, um, uh, but then the state has very specific objectives about who they would like that to be uh, available to, yeah. and not that that isn't a misguided um, objective, but I think that starts to, there ends up being a disconnect with rural, like how do you do that in rural communities, yeah. because now you're, you're having to prioritize uh, that, that unit to somebody who is then great if you can get them into that unit, but how are they going to access uh, some other public services that they likely need, like, uh, like transportation yeah. and, and other infrastructure needs. Um, so from my perspective, there seems to be like this big gap uh, in, in just like the logistics uh, of of applying those types of incentives and so I start thinking about whether or not we as a community want to look at again revisiting those village centers for just to kind of help wrap everybody's mind around that or and or um, I mean you know, I'm surprised that there aren't more case studies for rural communities uh, or research that's being done by uh, CVRP uh, to talk about like uh, creating incentives for subdivision or looking at ADU development similar to what's been registered, like recently so, pushed through. Yeah, so CVRP did actually have an ADU grant program with yeah. the application deadline has passed for that though. <clears throat> um, and so they have had some things. I do think we could likely be more actively communicating with our folks on CDRPC um, in order to make sure that Calus is front and center when they're thinking about some of these options um, and, and kind of unique needs. And I think, you know, you mentioned transportation, right? And 
one of the things that's been a major theme as we've been rewriting the town plan has been how completely interconnected every section of the plan really is to every other section. It's like, well, can we put this in housing? Can we put this in economic development? Can we put this in recreation? It goes in all of them, right? Um, and I think this is exactly one of those, right? Which is, it, we can't just put housing in a field somewhere if the people that could then benefit from it can't then leave that field without <laughs> us, right? And so how do we work with Green Mountain Transit when they're already talking about cutting back lines to add a line that would come up through Route 14, right? Um, or up the county road or, or wherever it was that made sense depending on where we might be able to work with a, an affordable housing developer to, to add affordable housing um, into our town. One of the other ones that uh, I've been just kind of noodling on, and, and this may be way premature, so please nobody hold me accountable. <laughs> <laughs> or throw it back in my face, but I, you know, so how do we incentivize people to uh, promote development in areas that we, that we have, a, we have our town regs that really well define um, development patterns that we want and, uh, and the values as a community that, that we have and how we want to see that development happening. But that doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, uh, that just gives us a, a way to say no. It doesn't necessarily give us too many ways to say yes. Yeah. And so, Often, if you are somebody looking to move into a community, you don't have much choice about where where you get to choose that opportunity to either build a house, move into an apartment that's affordable, et cetera, et cetera. So, it, can we pull at the thread a little bit of how do we how do we incentivize people to consider subdivision? or ADU development in town solid uh, centers or village centers? Yeah. And, and does that come in a form of a, uh, a, a temporary tax incentive or program that we create for, for current property owners to say, listen, maybe, maybe consider subdividing that parcel that you have in a, in a village center um, to not necessarily accommodate five units, but if we can add three or four units in the village centers that are uh, you know, two, two bedroom apartments that you know, share, share curb cuts in the way that we want them to share curb cuts, et cetera, et cetera, do, can we structure a tax incentive as a community that we that we find acceptable to help promote those those subdivisions be made? And if they're made, then they're more likely to be sold or built on. Um, and, and it seems like that's we only have so many mechanisms. But I haven't seen too many of those types of programs or incentives be created around yeah. Vermont. I've heard of them in other areas, but I, I haven't seen too many of them around Vermont. Yeah. Um, outside of commercial space, they, they, they do that a lot in the commercial space, but not, not yeah. so much in the residential One of the things I'd like to see us explore, I mean, there are lots of studies that show that if you build the sewer line, they will come. Okay, so, yes, that's the limiting factor in our so, villages. Definitely. But there's lots of studies that show you run a sewer line along Kent Hill Road. Mm -hmm. You're going to get lots of buildings on Kent Hill Road. So this is actually one of the things that I've been trying to explore a little bit more. Uh, I have a good friend who runs the new Lincoln Center at, at UVM that has like five years to give away all this money. And apparently wastewater is one of the things huge. they've really been studying because it's so huge. And she reports, and I have gotten a little bit more information about this, but have not had a chance to really read and process it yet, that there are new technologies that are allowing for more shared septic systems, yeah. which is not the same as adding sewer, but does potentially reduce the per unit cost of putting in wastewater system. Yeah. We should have a conversation about that, because I was just reading about one in, in particular that like that it acts as it can later then be hooked up to a municipal sewer system. So yeah. you have a very uh, flexible system that, yeah. that helps redirect a lot of the wastewater challenges of individual septic systems yeah. um, and, and then can later be infrastructure that, uh, that can be tied into a municipal yeah. sewer line. We often talk about additional tasks that Kari clearly has time for. <laughs> that we will have is essentially to have like a full-time grants applier. Somebody who's searching for grants, applying for grants, able to help us manage grants, 
because we do miss out on so much because we just don't have the capacity as volunteers to apply for all sorts of stuff. And clearly, as I said, Kari has plenty of time to add six different tasks <laughs> that's the same. Right. So. And again, it, it, it comes to this like disconnect in the funding. You know, that it's yeah. great to apply the grants, and there's huge money being put towards these projects, but often they're being distributed with like you know one-year application periods. Yeah. And you know, there's a push right now for shovel-ready projects, and it's yeah. just like how many people can we turn around to in the community to say, oh, I've got a shovel-ready five <laughs> five unit. Yeah. Uh, Communal sewer or uh, wastewater program, um, and and so you know, I, there's a lot of a lot of work to be done, but it, it almost seems like there's going to need to be a, a group of individuals um, focused on having those yeah. those concepts fleshed out and designed yeah. um, for the for the grants. Um, so we have a, a conservation commission. We don't have a housing commission. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we're a town that needs a housing authority. I don't think we're about to start having you know our own public housing building. But it does make me wonder if one of the ways that we would be able to have more focus on solving this would be for us to have a housing and conservation commission. <laughs> I wonder where that idea comes from. Um, that can give attention to both pieces of how we use our land. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd like to open it up to the public or anybody uh, online if there are any questions for, for Rachel or, or comments. No, oh, sorry, Barbara? Yeah, yeah. Hi, thanks for all that good work. Um, forgive me if I'm, if I'm misunderstood. Did I hear you say that we have a town service officer? I believe we're supposed to have a town service officer. We don't. <laughs> the, the previous select board eliminated that position Did years that ago. Optional? Do you remember when that was? I think the last one was Mary Ann Miller. You might know her. I do. I do. <laughs> position under state statute. Yeah. And that may have changed at some point. Okay, so. Yeah, I think it was eliminated, um, and I think the rationale was um, there's so many state agencies or access to state agencies readily available that people could avail themselves to the positions. Yeah. But I do recall. I, I do know it was eliminated. Yeah. I could remember yeah. the reason. Yeah. So I don't know if that's yeah. something that you are, mm -hmm. are wanting to make a recommendation that they reinstate that position. Mm -hmm. I mean, my memory is that Mary Ann rarely got calls. She rarely got calls. My understanding is when she got calls, somebody was facing a tax sale. And so it was like, oh, this person is making in financial elite dire straits. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of too late um, to necessarily be able to connect someone up with all the resources that could have been used to prevent that. Um, <laughs> so it may not be that that's the solution so much as having a liaison at Capstone. Um, the community action agency for our our, our town, so that mm -hmm. you know there's some communication with the people who they should be calling, right? If they need help with some of these things, like weatherization, or access to transportation, or food, mm -hmm. rent assistance, all those different things. So I had a second one, yes, which is so would you uh, describe or define affordable housing being thirty percent or less of gross income? Uh, specific to homeowners, mm -hmm. what if they what if they have paid off their mortgage? Yeah, and where does that fit in? Because I see yeah all the all this paperwork that comes in for Tegan to record and how often people are getting discharged of mortgage because they've paid it off. Yeah. So where does that fit into all these numbers? Yeah, so I think I ended up so. So for homeowners who still have a mortgage, their estimated median monthly housing cost is $2,093. For our approximately 270 homeowners without a mortgage, their estimated median monthly housing cost is $755. So obviously, you pay off your mortgage, your housing cost goes down, it doesn't go away completely because you're still paying your taxes and paying your utilities and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then combined, uh, the homeowners with and without mortgages, 155 households, around 25% of homeowners, 
are contributing 30% or more of their incomes towards half the cost. So I don't have the breakdown in terms of what I summarized here, but I do know the census did break it down between those two groups. Okay. And I think one of the things about people who paid off their mortgages is it takes you 30 years to pay off your mortgage. You're maybe more likely to be at that point on a fixed income once you're retired, so your income is lower. And so even though your home homeownership cost is now lower, it's, it still is maybe more than a third of your budget. But we also have a lot of trust fund babies. We do. <laughs> But that kind of raises an interesting point because right now you have uh, you have home prices and, and you have individuals who may be living uh, in them uh, because they're later in their years and they have completed um, the payment of their mortgage. But now that that number is going to get exacerbated as as those then those housing units then get sold to the yeah. next generation of owners who are then then going to absorb much higher uh, much higher costs associated with purchasing their houses. So, yeah. um, so you know, I, I've heard anecdotally, I'll, I'll come right back to you. Um, I've anecdotally heard that you know maybe we don't need to add as many houses as we feel like we think we need to add because we have an aging population who will be you know, who, who, you know, through attrition, I guess, will provide opportunity for more, more people to move into the community. But um, you sure into my grave? No. So I think. But you know, I don't think that that's a complete answer. And so the one last bit that I think for this cost of housing yeah. analysis, um, I, the. We've identified a need to build new houses, and what we don't entirely <laughs> accomplish there is the is the cost to actually build houses, which is hard data to get out of the zoning administrator yeah. because we don't. Right. I mean, I can speak to my own experience with looking at trying to build a house and being like, oh, it's actually less expensive to buy this one house on the market. Um, but yeah, no. I mean, I, a couple points that I would pull out of that. One is there's no senior housing in Cats, or no, like, or communal or congregate housing in Cats. So if people want to age in Cats, they're going to stay in their homes, even if, even if they may become quote unquote overhoused, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're done raising kids, and you still have a house with enough room for your kids too. Um, and so that's another thing that I think engaging with Downstreet about. Uh, is there a, is there room in Palace? I mean, Cabot now has a seen an affordable senior housing um, home for I think there's like eight or ten units. I can't remember. Is there room in Palace for that? Do we have folks who are interested in being able to downsize from the big house that they raised their family in and still stay in our town, mm -hmm. right? Rather than having to move to Montpelier or Barry or somewhere else um, and have extra support and aging in place. Um, and so I think that's also a piece of it. But yes, you're right. The, the entry cost, I think we have to admit, the entry cost to Calus is not affordable. Mm -hmm. If you look at what's on the market right now, there are two houses for sale under $250,000, two between two hundred and fifty and five hundred thousand, seven between five hundred thousand and a million, and we have two houses on the market in Calus right now between one and two million dollars. Which, and I think that also speaks to, to you know, uh, I saw a recent kind of study, but it was really more, uh, more of a marketing piece that was coming from a realtor. So look at the affordable opportunities in Calus. I was talking about houses that were sold under $300,000 yeah. and half of, no, two thirds of them were, were camps. Yeah. And so if, you're, if, if yeah. your only affordable structure yeah. dwelling yeah. is a seasonal residence that's going to come with the restrictions of, of not being able to be converted and yeah. and there is a rationale for that for sure yeah. uh, that puts a lot of pressure on on those camps yeah. um, for people trying to move into the community um, from from outside the community yeah. jennifer you had a, a comment you Sorry, to she did sort of touch on it what i was going to say is and this isn't you know a national problem is the older people who do they have nowhere to go there's yeah. nowhere right. for them to sell and as a younger person whose children have now fled, there's nowhere for me to go because there's nowhere for me to buy that's smaller and I would have to refinance. I have a fantastic interest rate. Like that's not outside of Palace. <laughs> that's outside of Palace. Like Palace can't solve that problem. Yeah. But I think just, you know, as a homeowner listening to this, 
opening up a conversation or just having some sort of dialogue about what sort of incentives or what you are allowed to do. Like as a homeowner, I'm not really sure what I'm allowed, what's, you know, what a accessory dwelling rules are. Maybe you having can add one. What? You can add one. Yeah, yeah. So like just, I think that would be, that might be just a great, very casual way to open up a conversation that could trigger 10 people of realizing that they do have the right situation that could create housing. Thank and you. Charlotte, you said you can have one, but in East Calais Village, we're limited by the number of hookups we can have yeah. based on our water system. So even two people asked for ADUs, and we said we don't have any hookups that we can provide according to state statutes, so or not statute, but until so until yeah. we have a bigger system where the state grants us more, we can't have an ADU added or anything yeah. in the East Calais water system. That, that goes across the board. I mean, if I wanted to build more rooms, bedrooms on my land, I'd have to upgrade my sewers, my septic yeah. system. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. That was a, a really good conversation. It's one that I enjoy having. <laughs> 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 Well, and, and to kind of pull it all together, really, I think Over. what I've really appreciated the Planning Commission doing in, in their approach is that they've, they've kind of unpacked uh, the way that previous plans have been written with uh, to-dos for very specific um, mm -hmm. groups. This is uh, a, an aspirational guiding document for document for all, all of the bodies of the town and yeah. anybody who is uh, in, engaging and mm -hmm. helping to um, contribute to the town and so what I what I like about pulling some of that out is it really opens up the charge to everyone so whether that's the select board I mean you're setting the goals but it's the select board it's the planning commission the DRB the conservation commission that we all have a role in participating and achieving these goals in each of the sections um, and to your point Rachel you start pulling out the threads of any one section and you're right back to the same conversations. And I think uh, the governor has said as much that the conversation always comes back to housing right now. That is yeah. our acute challenge. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I will readily admit we're not going to solve the problem uh, tonight. I think it'd be interesting to have a conversation with the Planning Commission about what we'll, how do we achieve these goals or work towards these goals after the town plan is written and, yeah. and what are some of the charges to come out of this and and does that mean having a conversation between uh, planning and conservation to, s to see how we can tackle um, yeah. both goals through uh, some collaboration there i i don't have an answer but that i think those are all conversations worth worth pursuing yeah i'm expecting larry will come because we do have land use coming yeah. up pretty soon and i know that the conservation commission has some ideas about what they want in that section sure that we certainly want to hear from them great um so i think that will happen and i think in terms of coming together with select board and planning commission after we finish drafting the town plan sounds great mm -hmm. doing that. until then it's kind of hard to think about how we actually operationalize some of these things yeah. in terms of our own work. Are, are you still on schedule to have a draft by November? We are doing our very best. <laughs> we added special meetings so that we're doing three meetings a month instead of wow. two wow. in order to have you a draft by November. So I'm here tonight. I'll be at Family Commission tomorrow night. So yeah, we're doing we're doing our best. Uh, if you could work in uh, some of uh, some of the building or land purchase price data in there from John somehow, I think that would be. Uh, I, okay. I do. Yeah. I do think that these documents can also be a good reflection of the time, um, yeah. mm -hmm. and and I have in many of these conversations. Um, felt like just everybody isn't working with the same <laughs> the same information yeah. um, and uh, it seems like we have some of that pretty locally accessible so thank you yeah john may not actually have the cost of building no but he'll i mean he has everybody who has gotten a permit for building so we can mm -hmm. reach out to and then we'll folks. have like market values roughly assessed roughly relative assessed. to yeah. um yeah so I, we may have to 
put an asterisk on that, <laughs> but it's certainly no worse than the, than the census data. <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you. Uh, I want to be sensitive. We're uh, running uh, oh, five minutes behind. No, no, we're I think I'm here for five, five minutes. Yeah, right. right. um, and, and next up uh, on the agenda is uh, a dialogue, an initial dialogue with the DRB uh, with Willa and Rachel um, Scott. And, and, and Scott, and those from the DRB who are here to chime in. So. I'm going to let Willa take my last seat, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Darn it. Can I just go ahead? Just go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'll, I guess, frame, frame the conversation a little bit. Um, uh, we're, we've been meaning to kind of carry on the conversation with the DRB and specifically carry on the, the last conversation uh, about uh, what what the DRB needs um, and some of the challenges that the DRB has been ex experiencing um, in, in the present environment that we are that we're in and some of the applications that have come through um, you know there's been a lot of changes in resources around the town and, and tools that we have um, and there's been and turnover um, so part part of what we wanted to kind of invite is a, a, a pretty open dialogue about um, what what the challenges have been for the DRB and, and how the DRB is feeling like uh, we might be able to help make some commitments to whether it's uh, having representation on the DRB that is uh, adequately skilled to address the you know complicated applications or quite literally just access to training um, and making sure that there's a budget for training um, or uh, digital resources for documentation um, or document review. Um, uh, we we want to hear all of it, um, and then we're we are scheduled to have that uh, another kind of carry on of this conversation. Um, uh, the the thirteenth or the fourteenth. Fourteenth. Uh, so fourteenth. Um, so with that, if, I'll turn it over to you, Willa. The, well, I have touch a few, on a few things, notes, um, and then obviously Rachel and Scott may want to chime in. Um, so I was thinking in terms of recent challenges, I would just say we have a fairly new board um, with that not a lot of experience. And as uh, the chair since March or April, I never, I'll say it's been a steep learning curve for me. It's one thing to be a member, and then it's another to become the chair really have to understand what you're doing. So, um, <laughs> you disagree? I don't disagree at all. <laughs> um, and, you know, we are a very collegial and resourceful group, so it, and I think we've been doing fine, but it's not easy. I think because we have vacancies, that makes it harder. We can just to get a quorum. So, as you know, we're shy of one regular member and two alternates. Um, and an issue that um, Scott brought up, who's, he calls himself interim clerk, but I just call him clerk, <laughs> is it's very difficult to participate in a hearing, which is a quasi-judicial hearing. You really want to be engaged and participate when you're also taking the minutes. So that, when we speak more formally, we have a, a meeting on the 7th where we'll be talking as a group about budget ideas, but one that we know we would be bringing is a request for support to, to have a paid recording secretary so that the clerk can actually participate in the hearings. Not necessarily our, you know, uh, administrative meetings. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been talking a lot about training. We've been looking at resources. We've talked to the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. We're trying to get um, a reference on it training they can provide us that's about $250. Um, we have various resources. Um, Brian Boyd from the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission has said he would come uh, and give us some more informal training uh, map resource. But we have been hesitant to sort of launch that without until we have new members. We feel like, why, um, why not do it when we have a full complement? So I think our immediate priority really is the recruitment for new members. Um, and I know Anne, you had drafted a recruitment notice that uh, Barbara had sent 
uh, to Jordan and me that I think could be a good starting point. But we talked in, um, I guess it was our August DRB meeting. Um, and so I just wanted to share the points that we had agreed. Uh, and we had a full, uh, yeah, we had a full, everybody, everyone was there. Um, so we think that it's important that um, people have some familiar right some familiarity, can't say that word today, with regulations or laws, mm -hmm. just how things work. Uh, willingness to learn and become familiar with our zoning regulations, which is not, um, is a bit of a daunting task, frankly. You know, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's clear, but it's a dense document. Um, commit to participate and engage in the DRB and be respectful to all parties. And, and I remember being asked this by the previous select board members, um, being comfortable with making difficult decisions that others might not agree with. So those were the criteria we thought were important for DRB members to have. Um, and, you know, the DRB members are willing to help recruit, interested to hear more about what um, the select board wants. Um, and then I just personally had a few ideas about an application process, which I'm not sure the board has discussed yet, but I think um, and when I was expressed interest, I spoke with Anne, who was then the chair. I think that's important that applicants speak you know, with the chair, or if the chair is unavailable, another um, experienced DRB member. I think it would be good to have, like, read the first article of the zoning regulations, just to sort of put your toe into the document start to have a sense of what um, is out there. Perhaps watch, when we now record the hearing, so you could watch a recording, or at least part of the recording, to get a flow and a sense that these are formal quasi-judicial mm -hmm. proceedings. Um, and then read a couple decisions, which I, you know, I think um, really lay out really what you're doing in making a decision. And speaking of a decision, I have to finish. You have one? Have one. Yay! Yay. For you, but already. Right. Well, well. um, so that, those are my sort of prepared notes here, but um, like I think, if, I don't know, Scott or Rachel, anything you would add? Mm -hmm. Well, we're really fortunate to have Willa as chair. You've done wonders in the year that you've been there, and, and we are a good collegial group. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd enforce that, reinforce that for sure. I've uh, enjoyed the dialogue uh, with Willa through the last uh, few months and, and the rest of the board. Um, communication is is really critical and, and often these are hard conversations to kind of wrestle through um, uh, and, and certainly in my experience with the tenure of the last couple of years on the select board it's so critical that uh, that, that kind of collegial uh, dialogue can be had and, and, uh, and enough openness for folks to feel like they can express uh, express concerns, differing opinions. Um, uh, I, we have so much work to do as a town. Um, I, and we're such a small community. Um, I think we are a very talented community. I sometimes get concerned about uh, being able to fill all of the positions uh, for, all, for all of the different boards um, and support the various initiatives um, and doing so in a way that provides opportunity for uh, for like diverse representation and, uh, and views and, and experience, frankly. Um, uh, and one of the things I think I'll throw on, on the table for consideration um, would be a little bit of a dialogue around the number, the number of uh, DRB board members uh, or the size of the DRB and whether it makes sense to go down to a five member board with more alternates to provide flexibility and scheduling or to provide space for, I, I really like the idea that given the quasi judicial needs uh, or a role, but like the need for very good note taking and, uh, and very um, uh, 
consistent um, documentation of the meetings um, and, and applications. Um, if, if doing that then affords us the opportunity to put people in those roles uh, or just assign formal roles. Um, does anybody have an opinion about that kind of approach or strategy? I mean, we have really big committees and, um, and I know just from my own personal experience, wanting to participate in all of these meetings uh, gets really hard. <laughs> um, uh, as, as somebody who's actively participating in it, so it really kind of just, if the only people who can participate in, in all of those or serve in those roles are people who have an abundance of time. Um, and, and that's yeah, hard. I don't think anybody on here has an abundance of time. No, right, right. <laughs> Um, so I would, my initial reaction is part of why having a bunch of people on the DRP can make sense is to share decision writing responsibilities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, they are not always super fast decisions to write mm -hmm. and so having, you know, Willa take one and I take one and Scott take one, Gabrielle take one or, or whatever can be helpful in terms of that can be as much or more time in the actual hearing. Right. Um, I think the other thing about making the group smaller is then do we have harder time making quorum to be able to have our hearings, right? There was one last year when Ryan was still chair where I had been planning to be there and then my dog got quilled by porcupine dance house. <laughs> Which Anne didn't know about because she wasn't there. But all of a sudden I was like, I do I need to like leave my dog at the vet and come to the DRB meeting? And fortunately we had enough people coming that we were not going to be out without a quorum if I stayed with her. But like things come up in people's lives. And so having a deep bench I actually think is helpful in terms of making sure that we can schedule meetings on time, you know, within what the statute requires and get decisions out on time. So I would be a little reluctant to shrink, but that's kind of a gut thinking out loud reaction. I don't know what would have been stopped. Yeah. Right now, the rules, you adopt your own rules, right? Right. So, so actually um, says we adopt their right. rules. Uh, do they allow for the alternates to fill in throughout, like, throughout, like partially through the decision process, or do you have to serve from the beginning to the end? I think you have to serve the whole yeah. case. For the whole case. Yeah. 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 So we have, you know, quorum is four, and we've made it. Mm -hmm. We're only having five members. Yeah. But it's really, I mean, frankly, one yeah. time I didn't make it for the exact same reason. Porcupine is <laughs> dog. 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 Porcupine. Um, but it is those last minute. It's that and then the scheduling. Yes. Just the, and, and we don't have a regular schedule. So we only right. schedule when there's, you know, a need. Right. So it's not like people are always holding, you know, Wednesday yeah. evening. So. And if we've had a hard time scheduling, we might be near the end of how long we have to schedule. Right. Here. Right. There are specific windows of time. I mean, my thinking is we have had a full board in the past, so I think, you know, if we make an effort to recruit, we just haven't put a word out, yep. um, and maybe we'll be successful, and, you know, if we aren't, I mean, we only need one full-time, like, regular member. Yep. Three alternates, and maybe a lot. Well. You, you've done a seat of um, um, Janet's. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So, so yeah. Two, two. two. So that's why your quorum has to be four. If you went down right. to five, your quorum would be three, three of course. Yeah. 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 Uh, to me, three would be on the too few side for some of the complexity and thinking mm -hmm. through things and the sharing of writing. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you, Ann. We need two. It's a seven-member yeah. board. Seven. It's a seven-member seven board. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so we need two five, full, five. Uh, we have two full vacancies, and then and one alternate. And one alternate. Yeah. All right. I, I want to see if this might help with scheduling. Mm -hmm. So granted, you don't have to meet like, you know, the third Thursday of every month or something like that. You only meet when you need to. But what if everybody on the DRV came up with one day a month, one evening a month, mm -hmm that you all say, if we need to have a DRB meeting, it's gonna be on this date each month. 
And that way, when something comes, and because you, you, you don't have to publish it, but you've all put it on your calendars. And then if nothing comes up and you don't need it, you don't meet. Mm -hmm. But everybody at least has saved the date. Right. No, it's a good idea. We'll uh, certainly bring yeah. that to the group. We yeah, can Tegan. We could also then block it off on the town hall calendar yes. so that the yeah. space was reserved right, for you exactly. if you used it. Because the, it's the select lot. board has every Monday reserved. They don't use it every Monday, but they have it in case. Yeah, yeah. but because it, it is easy to cancel a meeting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. People love meetings getting canceled. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one resource. That's an option. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, that came to mind when we were talking earlier during, is um, I think the town has a SharePoint site now. Yes. So, yep. I was wondering if oh, we would have amazing. our own uh, folder uh, just for the DRB, and then we wouldn't be always emailing documents back and forth. That has been uh, that's been brought up um, by a couple of committees, and I think both for uh, think planning, DRB, um, and emergency management, um, have, have requested because it's so document heavy. Those yeah. things need to also be relatively accessible uh, to other groups within uh, within the town. Um, we can, I, mean, I haven't gotten a clear answer on, actually I, I've got a soft answer. Um, <clears throat> so the easiest way to do something like that would to be uh, to assign a, a dedicated email address that is within the network. Um, and uh, I think we did that for the DRB, maybe? But it was on the list, so it was on the, our initial list when we started kind of sussing out this mm -hmm. uh, the system um, that we made for like planning commission and, and DRB to have an official email address, and then once we have an email address, you're in the network and you can have a SharePoint outside access to that those shared resources, um, you know, by outside email addresses is a feature I think we can turn on. Um, but it, it opens up a bit of a security risk um, and uh, a management process for making sure that people who are appointed uh, have the right access. So we just have to kind of create like a protocol around that. But I, I do think that that would be a direction that we should move and then um, we'll want to make sure that we're uh, that will come with a certain cost. Uh, it's not terribly expensive, especially, especially if it's at a basic level. So I think maybe what we should do is um, get a refresher on like what the true capacity is for a individual account, um, both at like the basic level and the like full uh, full rights, uh, like Microsoft 365 rights level, because uh, right now we have a couple of different tiers of access. Um, that provide access to like a full version of Word and all of the whole suite of Microsoft, right? So, um, and and present that to the a handful of committees and and have a conversation about which one would be most appropriate, so that we can work it into the budget for next year um, to make sure that that's that's something that we can do, uh, or or at least have funds appropriated for. Um, but that seems like a no-brainer to me, for sure. Um, and I'd love to get that rolling. If there's any way to get that rolling sooner, I guess, by spending out of a, a budget, um, we may have some room in, tech, in like um, the technology budget to do that. So with, you know, I work for state government. We have a SharePoint site, and we provide access to non-state individuals to the partners. Well, we yeah. without using a partner email oh, address. Oh, oh, yeah. So, it, I, I mean, I could always share what I know, whether we definitely, the same system is what SharePoint with the, the package that the town has in. Last, the most recent feedback I got, was, which was a couple of weeks ago, was like, yes, you can do it. You just have to, we just have that. Um, globally administered setting turned off uh, for, for initial security reasons. Because uh, we didn't kind of clearly define our ecosystem, and that was just the most risk averse position. But Because uh, we would only we want access to one folder. To one folder. And only certain people have access to that. Folder. Right. So. And that would mean standing up probably individual SharePoint, I think. Or we could put it under a town one, which we've already created, but we haven't started to use. Um, so the select board has their own, but the town has another one that we don't, I don't think we use quite yet, um, mm -hmm. because we have a 
server that most of the staff uses for that kind of shared stuff. So we'll, we'll pursue that uh, for sure. Um, and then I think the other thing that we need to make sure that we have a budget for is, is training. Um, and uh, what makes the most sense for bringing new members up to speed. I think you raise a pretty, pretty valid point. Um, new members, even, even if they have an interest in this stuff and are well suited for it, uh, will need some time to get up to speed on the town specific regulations. Um, and how do we do that and how do we set aside time for folks to do that? Um, and maybe it's a process of meeting with like the planning commission who, yeah. who structures the town regulations. Um, and we've yeah. had a bit of discussion on the board about how would we orient new members. Yeah. Yeah. So we've been talking about both training for everybody mm -hmm. and then and what future, or future orientation. So I mean, we could, you know, we've, we've drafted ideas, we kind of have anything formal to present, but. Um, I think we we actually do have a regular scheduled meeting once a month for the winter because we want to work on these um, details that are just going to be administrative. Um, so training and hopefully orientation of new members and continuing to look at our rules of procedure just to make sure we're all clear. Um, and so a few other sort of proposal ideas for the planning commission. We wanted to work on the application. Yeah. Um, so for, look, since you brought up the application, <laughs> and then before we kind of close out this conversation, um, are, are there any kind of last uh, parting words, I guess, to leave uh, for feedback? So uh, either skill sets or attributes uh, to put into a call for applicants uh, for these open positions uh, that we have. I can email you that little list that I read, but I, yeah, I think it's really a willingness to learn. That's still, yeah. Yeah, okay. that we didn't feel that people needed specific content knowledge per se, or, um, you know, really just willing to figure out what these regulations mean and spend some time committed to understanding them and I do. I think we did feel that it would be helpful if, some, if people have some understanding of how regulations work, you know, after, in whatever way that comes. Mm -hmm. At which you know it could be from previous volunteer experience, work experience. Um, you know, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we're eager to have some new folks and uh, get to work on our training. Well, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to join us tonight and the, the double participation, Rachel and, and Scott. Uh, thank, thank you for the contributions. Um, and with that, I think we'll move on and look forward to picking up the conversation a little more. So we'll um, try to coordinate on, on getting um, a call for applicants. Um, uh, hopefully in the, in the next week or so, we're, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, another committee um, to Point four, so there'll, there'll be a, there's some synergy there um, and some momentum, hopefully, um, to, to have some folks apply for a couple of different um, positions. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm good. Willa, can you email me that little list, too? I got three out of the four. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have a, a land sale proposal uh, yep. <laughs> on the agenda. Yep. Well, I have to go to the front seat. Yeah, if you want to come in the front seat. I would love to go. I'm going to turn over the minutes taking to TDN. Did you have an idea of that map was really hard to read on the computer? You know, we brought a smaller copy. <laughs> So uh, what we have before us to consider um, is a proposal to purchase uh, the Pelchuk's uh, property on the county road. Um, and uh, it, it, it is a, a thoughtful proposal. <laughs> so we just wanted to have an initial dialogue 
about uh, about that and uh, the opportunities that it, it could afford. Um, oh, I, I guess the uh, concerns that may uh, that may exist uh, about it. Uh, I think uh, it's certainly my understanding that. A purchase like this is going to have to. You know, there's no. There's no decision to be made at this point, but mm -hmm. uh, that would have to go before the the town um, uh, at town meeting uh, in one form or another. I would imagine um, if it's going to either be bonded or decided on uh, to be financed. Um, so with that, uh, so we have a copy of that proposal that was circulated. That everybody have a chance to kind of read through that and comfortable with the, the numbers that are being discussed. Um, I'll turn it over to the Pelchucks for a, so for a casual two, intro. So the two people that get affected, whatever happens the most, are is here Austin on the screen and what Jennifer And Jennifer Whitman. Those are the two that get affected the most because right away it goes through their areas. Mm -hmm. So we want to acknowledge them and um, be careful and cautious about um, their feelings and um, whatnot. So the proposal that we put before you is where we have been for the last couple of years actively trying to sell our 45 acre parcel of land that's off the county road. Um, we have a deeded right of way. The parcel is a um, 45 acre parcel, 35 acres are in the current use use plan, we have a forest management plan. The other 10 acres contain um, rock mineral deposits. Um, we have been operating wallstone quarry, um, but not overly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For the last two years, we really haven't been doing anything. Um, in 2023, when Calus experienced the big flood, the governor put in the emergency orders. We worked hand in hand with the town um, to come up with a proposal to um, have the town contract and hire a crusher entity to come in and crush. Um, and at the last minute, it fell through as far as the crushing entity. Um, but it certainly has the resources there. Um, part of it is grassy pasture area. Um, can be used for um, material storage. Um, Greg always had the idea that maybe put up a solar farm. Um, there is um, electricity with a um, transmission line on a nearby pole. That, um, we helped with the installation costs with Jennifer to put the pole there. We have a valid Act 250 permit that we got in 2023. Permits for 10 years. We renew it every 10 years, so we just got it renewed again last year. Um, and we are um, asking $450,000 as an asking price. And Greg and I are willing to hold the paper and finance it for the town for um, an annual payment for 20 years at 4% interest. Um, and you know, part of this part of this is we love the town of Dallas. We know whoever knows, you know, maybe some big developer could come in and offer us way more than that. When we initially tried or started selling it, you know, we said we're going to ask, you know, one point two million dollars, and we've come down and we had an auction and it was unsuccessful, um, and you know. Greg is looking to retire. Um, we have this asset there. We don't do anything with it. It's we all about paid for. Two years. We, we haven't, haven't done a stitch in two, in two years. It's just sitting there. Um, and we feel that it really has some value to the town. Now, in what capacity, I'm not sure. But we always know that for many years, the town um, wished and hoped that they had storage capacity or some other work capacity on this side of town and i think that that really fits the bill for that um we were approached two or three times to sublease it to build a barn for horses i won't go into that case please to go, to go uh, another thing to lease another section of it out and i didn't want to get it all tied up to the town to store other materials over there 
And I put a, I said no to both of them at the time. So anyway, we thought we would, you know, talk to you about it, see if you think it's anything the town would be interested in purchasing, and if not, we'll try to sell it again. Um, we did get a, right, an offer that Rose says it's a scam, but I went on the internet to the site, and it is out of South Carolina, so I have no idea what they're going to do. Scam. <laughs> <laughs> There's different levels to actively selling your property, and we're kind of, I think, on the sleepy side of it. You know, it's just sitting there. But, um, you know, we think it really, you know, and especially with, we've noticed the change in weather patterns. We know that with these two floods in 2023, 2024, gravel resources in this area are becoming more scarce. Um, Could you talk about that a little more? You said you have an Act 250 permit. Exactly what's it? For and what does it's it allow? It's wall stone. What can, does we that can mean? blast, okay. we can hammer, and we can load it up for making field stone walls. Ah. It does not have a crushing permit. The town will have to go and amend our permits to crush it. If I was going to be nice, and I would be nice, <laughs> and neighbors around, I would stipulate that if you were going to crush, you crush in two months. The month of May, when everybody's windows are still closed and the stuff hasn't started, or the month of November before the end of our permit, because our existing permit goes from May 1st to December 1st. Mm -hmm. And those, and with the technology they got now, they can crush enough material in three weeks, four weeks at the outside, to take the town for the whole year or more. And that would be important if we actually wanted to make Right. If you because like to we have it. to make it smaller yep. than walls. Yep. Yeah. It's just like the gentleman that we talked about last yes. summer, and it got down, and I wish you would do it. Because if you went through it, we wouldn't be even sitting here talking right now. Because you guys would probably be on the place for it. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. I didn't. It would take three weeks yeah. to. It crush about 8,000 yards. That's what our permit allows. And, and that's what the town would use in a, in a year? We use probably about five to 6,000 yards a year now with the cost of the material as high as it is. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the average room based material now is going anywhere from 1850 up to 2250 a ton or a yard. So if possible, then we could actually sell crushed stone? No, you in don't want to sell. Mm -hmm. You, know, you want to keep, keep it, it for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. no, I'm not serious about this. Yeah. You keep it for yourselves. Because if you guys decide to do it, this is your thing that will go on to this town, and they can keep extending the permits if they do it properly. We've done it already, three extensions on it. We can keep going, this can keep going for 100 years. No, don't say that until right. you try to add 250. <laughs> but the biggest thing is you've got two sites of rock there. Mm -hmm. The back section is all granite. Mm -hmm. The front section is all black schist, like Pike uses for their asphalt. Mm -hmm. And between the two of them, back when I had a brainstorm to do this 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I forget now, 99, that one of the guys at the original deposition was Jim McDonald. And mm -hmm. he was in the McDonald quarries over there in where Bigfords are. Mm -hmm. And his idea is he could crush it in the fall back when we were doing depositions, so he wanted to go and mix granite and black schist together and see what would happen if he ran it through his crushers. <laughs> but we never were able to do that. Mm -hmm. Think of what we pay for gravel now. We go to Wolka. It's a trucking charge. It's I've got a, we're, we're, in the, we're in the gravel trucking business now. And now, the time it takes, the so per hour cost. Would we have the capability to make every kind of gravel that we need? I'm no expert, but I know that we, Bill, you could probably help me out with this. In fact, you would know, Greg. We, we need several different grades well, of need, gravel, you don't need, Yeah, you need dunce graded, which is two and a half inch minus. You need three quarter to one inch, which is your regular stone on our roads. And you would need ditch stones, and then the next thing you need, you need some big rocks for the waters that we're going to be getting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we could get all that out of this. Well, the first step would be, though, 
you know, if you decided to purchase this land or whatever, you have to amend the Act 250 permit. Well, I understand. Um, yeah, to because crush. it doesn't allow it doesn't allow for crushing. But I can tell you, I think that a municipality versus a private entity trying to amend the permit to have crushing, I think a municipality um, perhaps would be easier than doing it for a private individual. Um, and the biggest thing is, is to keep it small scale. That's what we did from the very beginning. I don't think we've ever got up to over 2,000 yards as our best year in 30, well, we've been there since 2004. Probably about 50 to 1,600 yards is our best year mm -hmm. between wall stone and scrap rock to sell to local yards around. So uh, it's, it's a big conversation. Uh, I maybe don't want to get too far into the weeds on, on the crushing right. uh, too much. Uh, you know, I think. I think that uh, with a little bit of imagination, you can kind of pull out the strings of what the benefits uh, would be uh, for this. Whether whether we're crushing it, or using it as storage, um, you know, in, in, in very the handful opportunity or uh, occasions, uh, I've I've been a party to conversations about a, a need for some sort of uh, stump dump or. Uh, for for the town, which we don't really have, um, especially if we're pulling down, you know, uh, trees, ash trees. Oh, the ash trees are going to go someplace. And, and making that making that material available to mm -hmm. uh, to community members who can use it for firewood, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, you know, I think. Well, that was a question I have. What is a, what is in the forest? Okay. What, what was that? Well, well ma'am. Or um, Anne. Yeah. <laughs> The um, it's mostly softwood. Is that oh, right? no, in the in oh. the thirty-five acres? Yeah. It's mixed it's woods. Mixed all yeah, the hard wood. It's um, mixed. What have you been man have you been managing it from timber? Yes. Yeah. Timber and pulp. It's in current use, I believe. Correct. It's in yeah, current yeah. use and, and we have a forest um, Red Star. Red Star, Red Star out of. Um, oh, Kari's brother. Is the yeah, Marcus Bradley. Marcus Bradley. Okay. <laughs> Bradley. Bradley. Look at that. He's a big guy. Started with uh, he actually it was Paul, Kate, and Marcus that started with us in '99. And they're still doing it. Small town. Mm -hmm. So when was the last uh, logging time you logged? Um, Jennifer, what? Two years ago? Two years. Not last year. Or twenty-two. Recently. Twenty-two. 22. There would be yeah. potential to con to to continue. Well, yeah, about every ten years, because I we make them do selected. They did one little clear cut. I guess it was behind Gene, uh, Don, Don Bowles' old place, Bob Bowles, Bob Bowles because of the, it was red, red pine, pine, red pine plantation was not well. It was, was, well. It was so sick. He amended the forest management plan so in order about to an acre, get rid of it. Acre and a half or two acres yeah. of trees Thank went you. by. Um, the front section, when we talk about setting you know, solar, it was when Jennifer and Rose were putting the pole in, we got to talk to a the electric engineer, and I probably should have sold it about 20 years ago because it'd be generating money every day of the week, but I didn't. But There's the, a nice flat pasture in the front area, couple acres. and it will generally look at solar panels. Austin may look at them, but I think it's done under, under the dip enough that they may not really There's no panels so. there. There's nothing there. Yes. Uh, you notice a finger of property going down to Bliss Pond Road. Is there access through there? No, we never did that. But it's part, we own the property. No, own the it's property. A, a, I don't know how wide strip and 300 street. foot of road front and jump Bliss Pond Road. We just wanted to, instead of being completely landlocked mm -hmm. and relying only on the deeded right of way, we said we wanted to do it. And so when we subdivided, we bought the land from Stanley Morris, the late mm -hmm. Stanley Morris. That's the way we just reconfigured or configured our parcel that we wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, since we have the uh, <laughs> the adjoining property owners here, I just would, uh, I, I want to invite um, uh, Jennifer and uh, Austin to kind of speak to um, what what their thoughts are. Um, uh, Austin, there's uh, 
I, I guess is the, is the right of way uh, wholly on Austin's uh, property and then mm -hmm. you're immediately adjoining, right, uh, Jennifer? So. Um, the right way doesn't go on Jennifer's property. No, I, 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 I it's, it's right, it's right, it's right alongside. It's right alongside. It's yeah. yeah. Um, so I just give it a, a, an opportunity to let Jennifer register kind of your thoughts or concerns or uh, hopes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I've been there for 13 years. I, these folks are like a second family to me, mm -hmm. so that complicates it a little bit. Um, I don't mind the quarry as it was. Um, I didn't mind when the town needed to use it for an emergency reason. I rent my house out to be VRBO and Airbnb, and I lost $5,000 because of that. But I was okay with it because it was an emergency situation and a lot of people were having you know, adverse reactions to that. Um, it would totally change my quality of life if there was rock crushing and trucks in and out. I have a little tiny house in the back of the property that is adjacent to the road um, where I live in the summer, and I don't think I would do that if there was trucks going by all the time. There would be no more privacy or quiet. That being said, I 100% understand the need for it in Calais, and I just wouldn't want it to get to be some bigger scale, like keeping it, like Greg said, at that scale, totally fine. Trucks during business hours, totally fine. A shortened amount of time to do the rock crushing or whatever they need to do, that seems completely reasonable to me. When I was signing in and said to Rachel, like, oh, there's this proposal in this land and there could be affordable housing. And <laughs> that was something I'd never heard before. And like, to me, like, I want there to be affordable housing. I want to build affordable housing in my house. But I just, that's terrifying because like, what does that look like, right? Like, is that now a road, like a major road to 30 houses is where my imagination went. Um, and I know that, you know, Austin has this road goes through his driveway, like right next to his garage. Like that is his home and his dooryard. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be significant for him. Um, and noise and we have animals like, you know, dust. I have a bog that I have these American bitterns that I'm obsessed with. I would like them to still live there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we all would. So yeah, so like I am compl I'm not against this idea. I don't want this to get scaled up to something bigger than it already is. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Austin, did uh, you want to come off mute and share any, any particular thoughts? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, First of all, hi, everyone. Um, I don't have the same uh, long-term uh, stint in Callis as Jennifer does. Um, I moved here last April. Um, but uh, she she definitely hit the nail on the head. Um, I have a lot of the very similar concerns that she does. Like she pointed out, it does uh, go directly by my property, by my garage, um, and and down the you know entire stretch of my land. Um, and I've had no problems with it the way it is. Greg's been a, a wonderful person to share that property with. Um, but like Jennifer said, if that was to change into a, an active road for affordable housing or if there was going to be trucks coming in and out at all hours of the day and the night, that would definitely uh, alter the plan I had set up for uh, myself and my girlfriend when I moved up here last year. Um, like she said, she has... Um, things that severe dust and things would affect um uh and just you know the the overall just image that i had of uh when i moved out here to callus so um mm -hmm. those would just be my concerns but again i understand like uh, like jennifer said the need um for you know use of the uh use of it for the town or even the scale that it's at like i said i have no issues with the way it has been over the last um year and a half i've been here we haven't done anything <laughs> <Well, yeah. laughs> trucks to bring material in and in and in yeah. and then yeah. when they got it up enough they would move out with mm -hmm. the three cows trucks and uh, some other the trucks that they had available they would be able to move out about 600 yards it took me a week to get all in there it was i was working from home at that time in the tiny house and it was not horrible like like it was not if it was like that all the time year round, it would definitely be rough. But it was not even, I don't think, as many trucks as you thought it was, right? 
Because I was well, sitting right there. You kind of built the towel. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Definitely dusty, and um, something the town put out about the granite dust changing the um, acidity of bogs. Oh like there God. is, there's like things like that that I just never thought of that are other things to think of. Um, it was dusty. It's a safety thing. Uh, we have animals like that. It's a little nerve wracking, but um, like I said, like the, a little bit of trucking during business hours. Totally appropriate. The other thing mm -hmm. that I worry about is just my driveway is terrible. They they have the um, what's it called the 52? What's your your designated driveway at the end? It's a big paved oh, yeah, trucking apron. Driveway. The yeah. apron there's a number for it. So they have a fantastic oh, okay. B71. The B71. Make up the B71, and it's amazing. But that that exact stretch of County Road is where everybody. <laughs> is where they, well, if they're coming from Woodbury, that is where they hit 65, and that is oh. where they pass. So in front of my driveway mm -hmm. is all the time two cars, like one car passing another, and so right up to that truck. So the increasing of truck like that just makes me nervous. Oh. That mm -hmm. This is another thing to think of. Mm -hmm. sure. um, there's a lot in this proposal, <laughs> and um, <laughs> It's really hard for me to really weigh things. So I would love to see some kind of uh, cost benefit, um, ways of mitigating costs. Are those mitigations effective? Would they work? Um, I would love to see something that I could look at and see how do these things weigh out. Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of where, uh, certainly where, where I'm at. I, I think there's uh, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, I think as a town, we uh, have to take very seriously an opportunity to procure land yeah. uh, when it becomes yeah. available, uh, when it's being offered uh, with pretty favorable market terms. Um, and what, and um, so there, there's, a, there's a lot to weigh. We would be abundant. <laughs> yeah. I, understand, I understand the problem. I think Charlotte just volunteered because of the committee. And so I think it would uh, be best to kind of commit to uh, do an exploratory uh, kind of analysis and, and invite in a conversation with uh, at least two other committees that I can think of um, that might be able to uh take that cost benefit analysis uh into consideration um and uh and, and see what we can see what we can kind of come up with um that lays out uh, that lays out that cost cost benefit analysis and and some of the considerations relative to use you know we we, we can take a walk before we run approach uh if we uh if we need to um you know i i Really do hear and register uh, the concerns of both Jennifer and Austin and Scott. Did you want to make a comment? This would be a major big deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> scaled with the Curtis Pond Dam. Uh, there was a member of the select board, Jamie, who was sort of liaison for that. It would be on the scale of this building. I was on the select board um, and was sort of the champion of making this happen. It, it had been uh, neglected by the town for years and years and years. And uh, with the help of Cy and many, many, many other people, it happened. But it was a great help to have me on the select board when we were trying to get it, get it going. Mm -hmm. um, a project this big needs a champion on the select board, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I, I think I think you're right, and, and I think there's going to need to be somebody who can uh, who can answer those uh, questions um, from uh, from a somewhat ob objective uh, standpoint. Um, not uh, objective. Not a wall. Fighting, fighting, fighting for it. Fighting for it. Fighting for it. Yeah. Um, I won't go that quite that far. I, I think there still needs to be a fair amount of uh, objectivity uh, in, in, involved in, in the 
consideration uh, just because it seems like prudent governance, but... Uh, oh, yeah, certainly objective for the whole board. <laughs> but, um, um, a person, a Jamie or a Scott, so on the board who would fight for it. I'd like to... Uh, we're not a full board tonight. Um, I, I think it would be good to put this back on the agenda for for maybe uh, the, uh, the 14th for a brief conversation. Uh, about making that particular appointment and maybe making some commitments to what the next steps are for exploration um, and, and kind of vetting the opportunity more fully. Yeah. Uh, does that make sense? Well, if you read my sort of mini yeah. analysis, what I'd like to do is start penciling in a cost benefit analysis. And it's going to be rough, right? We're going to make a lot of estimates other than the, the purchase price. That's, that's the most concrete piece of it. But we can at least start, you know, fleshing it out and get to a point where we can ask, what else do we need to know? Yeah. Or you know, what more detail do we need? Or what other considerations are there? Yeah. Um, so it starts to say, um, picture. I, I'm happy to work on that. Well, <laughs> but I, I could use some help. Okay. Yes. I actually can give him some information because I did chart studies for this town for many years oh. from all the different quarries and what it cost them times and how many hours of each yeah. employee. Right, yeah. 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 So the hourly rate yeah. when you pay the drivers and managers, very to, to be fair, <laughs> Greg, the optics of uh, like, <laughs> <when you pay. laughs> all of the information that it needs to get <laughs> We looked at, I remember taking a look at those figures when we were oh, yeah. looking and at for the crushing and, and, and But like the mileage from here to Benash and Rolkit, that's the same. Yeah. Or from here to South McCullough's and South oh. Berry, all that mileage, he's been, you know, he's given this to the select board so many times. Also, you want somebody that's in the committee and most of it, should say, but I'm going to say, on a conservation one because we have been protecting for the last, well, since Stanley, yeah. handed over us. There is a yep. burner pool that we've been protecting for over 25 years already. It's probably one of the largest that's not in any mountain counties. Yeah, and, and, and I think that that, that is, uh, for a multitude of reasons, yeah. something that yeah. needs to be carefully considered, yeah. both, both on the operation side, but maybe also on the opportunities of involving the Conservation Commission. Who, yeah. Really, really good. Yeah. Stanley pointed out it to me about it in 99. Um, is that right? No. Right right no. Oh, just go take a look. Oh, you've got this. We have it, but we can. Uh, okay. It's kind of a drive right now. It's so dry now. To go back to one more time and help us out. Back in 99, we should be able to drive our truck stop. I'm wondering if you could know some of the trails. Can you take a quick look at it? They might like to do that. and. Would it be worth asking the Energy Committee to at least think about the solar panel proposal? Yeah, it's only one way to get it in all year. I don't think the Energy Committee is has functioned. It's not a, yeah, it hasn't been set up as an official but, committee. Um, yeah. No, but they might. Oh, well, okay, you've been talking to Bill. Um, yeah, two of Somebody may be able to comment on that. Yeah, uh, those seem to me some things we could talk about. That's why we can do it. Um, so do you want to commit to a, a follow-up uh, time? Do you, do you want to try to revisit it for uh, 10? Yeah, 10-14. Okay. So um, I can just ask Rose and Greg, did you have a sense of how long this offer oh, is good? We're flexible. As long as you, as long as you get the vote by, by Tom meeting day, the offer <laughs> well, will be nice. We don't know. You can't put that kind of pressure on them. <laughs>
next meeting agenda. Uh, but thank you, Rose and uh, Jennifer and Austin. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, you guys. Rose, when do I get come over? What? When do I get come over? Oh, you can come over. So moving on to the fiscal okay. budget conversation. Uh, this is really uh, tedious. Yeah. All right. Sorry, I'm finishing up. Um, so I was putting together all of my things because I didn't realize we were just talking town office and town hall today. Um, right? That's how. I'm, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the focus. Um, do you want me to go over it line by line? Do you all want to ask questions? How would you like to do it? Oh, Since I'm the guinea pig, is it a Yes. Yeah, it's just anything that's significant. That's okay, significant. there are a couple of little tweaks. The thing that's interesting as you start general office is that we, at Sandra's suggestion, we switched everything from two line items to five line items last year. And so we're still sort of hashing out how everything shakes out when you do that. Um, the. So I guess I'll say, so Nimric, Kari did those rough estimates. I trust him. He pays the Nimric bills. Uh, the COTS contract is 270 a month. It's been 270 a month. I don't foresee it changing, so that gives us that line item. Currently, our IT support contract is always 714.75 a month, so that doesn't look like it's changing. I have emailed Ruben to ask as we go through this server to cloud transition if that's going to go up. He's still putting together a package of budgeting for me, so he doesn't have an answer there. Um, education and training has been a little all over the place because that's my fault. I've been learning coding for uh, invoices this year, and I believe anytime I went to a conference, I put it under the select board education line instead of the town clerk training line. I will be better about that this year. Um, and I intend to do more trainings this year. There's a lot of really great opportunities in Vermont and in New England for clerks, <coughs> and there's a lot to learn. Uh, so I'm hoping to get out there and really dig in and learn more about my job. Um, maintenance for the town office is pretty straightforward. Generator maintenance. Um, I'm still trying to figure out why those numbers are all over the place. So I will work with Kari. I think part of it was that maybe sometimes the town hall generator was being put under the office generator, or maybe the previous select board just really thought it was going to cost $3,600 in maintenance. I'm not sure why that's why they had, or that's why we had. It seems extraordinary. It seems really high. So I, I think that's, I put it at 1200 and if you and I talk we, about we it, can we it. can get it down. Yeah. Can I just say one thing about that? Yes. For the maintenance contracts on those, you can have it two times a year or one time a year. Yeah. So that might that be might be a it. difference in your numbers. Um, I feel like when we looked at the invoices, though, even when it was even when they came, it wasn't that significant. Of you can look at the contract. We Brookfield service, Brookfield they come yeah. and they do like an oil change and a run through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember signing the contract. Yeah. I don't remember whether it was two or one, but we have the contract. I think we did two. two I think we did, did two. two. Although I couldn't, um, I wouldn't swear to it, but. Um, but it still, it should be pretty. I so think they do a big one and then a small one. Yeah. So there's. I had to pay about $400 for each visitor, something like that. Well, so yeah, I guess we'll just get a, a sharper number on that. I get, the only other thing I think I register in there, even if it is uh, reduced for uh, whatever reason, for, it just seems inflated unnecessarily. Um, we do have a lingering uh, need to consider moving the generator. That's, this is the town uh, office generator. Oh, the town okay. hall generator is in a different spot. Gotcha. And the school one isn't related to this And the school one is all. not related to us at all. Interesting. Um, yeah. So I have two invoices that have come in in this fiscal year. One was for June, January to June for the generator, and it was 385. One was for our annual service and inspection, and that was almost 500. Mm -hmm. So I think I was thinking Barbara's 400-ish three time. I'm, I'd have to look to see if there's another invoice that comes in July through December to see if that's, if we're looking at like 900 or if we're looking at like 1200. Okay. Um, but those are, either way, it's going to be more in that range than the 3,600. Facilities maintenance is the Gospel Hall Warden. He gets 200 a month. 
Um, telephone and internet, I put where we got those numbers from. Advertising is a ballpark. We just, it comes up, it comes up more frequently than I thought it would, whether it's between advertising for jobs or posting warnings for the, for things we have to warn. Like it just, it's a thing that comes up. It's better to have enough in there. Uh, postage kept going up last year, so we kept buying postage. I think we have enough that we won't have to buy as much next year. Really hoping. Um, Can I add something? Yes, Except absolutely. that things come up. So for example, the I don't think the listers but had budgeted for this fiscal year the postage to do all those reappraisal postcards. Yeah. So things do come up. Things do come up. Yeah. Uh, and I am working with Kari to still figure out like when something like that comes up, is that a lister expense or is that a postage expense? When the listers need to send those postcards, and we talked about the paper today that we purchased for them, does that count as a lister expense? Or, so working out those details will help us get better numbers. Um, office supplies kept it pretty standard. Uh, same for office equipment. I know the listers, uh, Kari took two of the chairs the listers ordered to use for his chairs, and the listers would very much like to have fancy chairs back. So we need to order a few more chairs. That'll bump things up. Um, Kari's there a few more hours. He has a few more hours. He's also a little younger than that crew. So, you know, it counts. Uh, so there's security, and then we get down to the software licenses and the technology reserve, and that's another thing where I really need to talk to RV Tech about what we are looking at, especially as uh, Jordan just offered to buy some more licenses. So I <laughs> that <laughs> software licenses category. Said we would look into it. <laughs> you said it was a no-brainer. Actually, uh, those were your I words. Advocating. Um, I did not make the decision. So I'm assuming that we might have kind of a flip-flop in those two columns where software licensing is going to go up significantly, maybe not to 9,000, but significantly, and the technology reserve is going to go down if we're only putting out money for computers, printers, you know, smaller tech items. Mm -hmm. uh, town office reserve fund seems fine. It's great building. If we really wanted to look at making the bathroom ADA accessible, we would need to be putting more money into that. But other than that, it's a great building. Uh, we bought our AC unit, so that will just fall off the edge of the budgeting spreadsheet after, as the years go by. Thank you for the AC unit. So that's town office. Any questions there? No. Thank you. And then town hall. Uh, Kari and I did a little bit of this together. Mm -hmm. Uh, maintenance is. Actually, can I yeah. Let the town office. Yeah. How's it working out with all you guys in there together? It's fine. I, mean, I think it's fine. It's the same number of people, really, because they um, essentially we, replaced Sandra. Except Sandra hadn't been there in two years. <laughs> okay. Um, well, no, four years. Four years she yeah. left in, in January when COVID hit. Of uh, 2020. Oh, yeah. Um, so she wasn't there. We've been concerned years. about outgrowing the town office, uh, so I hope you're telling us that's not imminent. So I, I think it's the space fine. It's okay. Noise level is always an issue. Yeah. Noise is a little challenging. We are looking into, unrelated to, the, well, maybe eventually related to this, getting um, a part for Barbara's phone that will either make things louder or put things directly into her hearing aid so she can hear better on the phone because she's been struggling with that. And we all, like, if I see one person is on the phone, and particularly two people on the phone, I never start a phone call. There is no way three people can talk on the phone in that office at the same time. It's, that part is challenging. I think adding another person in there even for 20 hours a week would be a challenge. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that if there were four people, you know, working in there, not including listers, um, it would be noisy, it would be, it would be more, just more cramped. Distracting. I wonder if, um, if it's worth taking a look at uh, putting uh, like some partitions uh, in that are more like uh, cubicle partitions to absorb uh, some of the sound um, would, would help. Um, a lot. <laughs> uh, it would, there's we not a ton of. Over the years, yeah. we can pull that information out if we wanted to. 
and if that's something worth exploring. Um, Kari, you're still in the corner of the office yeah, I, I, space there, which is some, somewhat awkward and probably very distracting as folks are coming coming into the office. Uh, uh, it, but they're delighted if they want to see him, that he's in there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this doesn't, this doesn't have any of that, any of those adjustments in, in there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is that needed? Is that what well, you're considering? Yes, I was, in, in three weeks we're going to have the discussion about my performance evaluation. I think that leads to a conversation about staffing models. Yeah. Which space is directly connected to. Mm -hmm. So I see that all as you know, part of the larger conversation. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no doubt we're going to have to do something if we continue to, to grow. I mean, even, even adding a half-time person, I think, there are some solutions. Okay. Janitorial? Yeah, Town Hall. Uh, janitorial is Kyra reminded me we swapped budgeting line items, but it should be 2400 That is what we pay Donna to clean this building mm -hmm. on the regular. Uh, supplies are straightforward, utilities. Um, um, can I ask uh, on that line, it says generator increased power bill significantly. Yes. What, what happened with that? Why? We put in a generator and the power bill went up a bunch. It's a, it's a head bolt heater in the winter. It, it, um, I, I can't explain it, but it actually sort of doubled the um, electrical usage in this building. Yeah. We turned it off in the warmer months, but it's going back on again within the next month. Is that simply because it does a test every week? And no, it's just it's no. warming the battery all winter long. Uh, so that wow. if and when the, the generator needs to turn on, it's warm enough. Do they have a solar accessory that you can add to it? So I, I don't know. I haven't looked into this at all, but um, we, it took us a while to figure out what was going on because yeah. the, the bills just shot up last October. That was two thousand bucks. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So it's really it's disappointing. Circling back to the generator <laughs> comment that I made yeah. before. Yeah. Um, uh, I casually tasked Bill with uh, with bringing the the moving of the generator to uh, to a new location coming up with a solution and there's, it's a lingering to do that has come that has come up um, and, and I think we should probably budget for it the town is going to have to pay to, to move it or come up with a solution we just have to know what that solution is this one mm -hmm. yes um, and so that that's a one thing that needs to be considered and I wonder if in that kind of proposal we we also task uh, Brookfield with figuring out ways that we can bring that cost down. Um, you know, I, I don't know that we need to move the generator next year, six months, whenever. That's that's not an urgent thing. It, it's. It's an unfortunate eyesore, uh, but so is the propane tank and a couple of other things. But I wonder if we can task Brookfield with giving us a little bit more information about um, how we might be able to reduce those costs. Um, and in that, if there is a solar option, can we bundle that into moving, moving the generator? Um, the relocation of the generator. If we move it to another portion of the building, it has better view or uh, better better exposures for <laughs> not better view. It will have a better view, uh, but it, it may have better exposure. Maybe we can offset some of that with like a solar something. Sure. Uh, it's also a lot bigger than me by more than three times. Yeah, it really is. But what, what it puts out. Now I'm not sure if that was just the way we got it, or what we got where the money came from to purchase it. Oh. Well, it was a, it was an ARPA uh, originally. Is um, that considering the fact that this might be used as an emergency emergency, emergency shelter, shelter and would have a lot of stuff plugged into it if we were using it? Still, it's, it's, have it's, you identified any options for relocating it? Because I thought floodplain was a 
you're concerned and talking about it. It's, 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 it's a question of floodplain, it's a question of view shed as well. You know? Yeah. Hmm. So I, I think it's really kind of a, a something that the design review uh, board uh, just needs to, they're well positioned to weigh all of those, most yeah. most critically uh, the... Design of that report. Yeah, uh, you know, I think Nick stands ready to assist and, and help facilitate it as he can. He, he's going to have the most line of sight on why they opted for that particular side. But I, those, I don't have that key, those details. And if in considering a move, we can reduce its size uh, for whatever reason. Um, that, that seems like that would be advantageous as well. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, one other factor that's just frustrating to me is consolidated. Its prices have gone up and up and up. So we are paying for consolidated to do our phone lines at this right. building at the town office, partially because they have the kind of lines that our security system works with mm -hmm. and consolidated does not. So we're paying for the most expensive internet and the most expensive phone lines. And there with the fiber, is there any way to move the move the security system? Over not with the security system. We would need to do a different security system. Really? Who, who's your security with? Do you, is it Mountain View? Mountain View. Yes, you could Mountain View. Security, security is fire, fire alarm? Yes. But isn't a phone a phone? No, I'm just... There are hard lines and there are soft lines and there are... Okay. Yeah, there are different ways to do it. Okay. It seems like it would be worth looking at what a security system change would be, the cost of that relative to yeah. the cost of letting go of the phone lines. That, that's In the current fiscal environment, it seems yeah. like we're finding more ways to spend money, so I'll, I'll try and to temper <laughs> my recommendations. And but, getting away from consolidated is yeah. a good idea. They're not easy to work with. And the town hall reserve fund uh, is a reduced six thousand dollar contribution this year. It's the same as we budgeted last year. Yeah, yeah we reduced it last. We reduced several of the reserve yeah, funds. Yeah, that was the ones we reduced. We'll have to look at that this year. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any? Actually, maybe maybe you could just put a note in that, Kari, because we can we when we reduce them, we kind of said, well, we'll try to go back up to the regular contribution next year, just so that we won't lose that as something to think about when we revisit. Uh, one okay. of the things that put in put in with that, it's uh, anything that is a reserve fund. It'd be helpful to know what the fund balance is um, okay. for for each of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really our only, there's not a lot of discretionary room, um, and that, that would be helpful. Right, you know, we're gonna <laughs> consider each of them, and then we'll get to that point. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any other feedback or input for these particular budget items? Thank you, Tegan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Kari. I'm uh, Kari. This is, we're on our way. Okay. To start. Uh, do, you need, do you need any other information from us uh, at, at this point on, on either of these or feedback? I don't think so. I made some notes and I'll nail some things down and hopefully I'll get all the uh, software tech questions answered. Um, Part of that was waiting on us to get on the Nimrit cloud, and that is scheduled for Thursday morning. So, ba 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 ba, here we go. Once that happens, RB Tech can start moving their things onto the cloud. Okay. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm still thinking about the reserve funds. I wonder if it wouldn't make sense in this draft to put them in at the level that we'd hope to fund them. That's, what I, that's what I heard you saying. Oh, yeah. Okay, Re yeah. Reset to Reset prior to 10, levels. And then, yeah. and then we'll go from there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, a, and a note about where, where they are, where the fund balance is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You. Thank you. That's fine. And so then, in terms of next steps with the budget, 
Barbara, do you want to run down, the, can you, what the schedule is in October for committees? And oh, I've got my own scribbled notes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have most of them scheduled. The next meeting, October 14th, we are confirmed to, to do town park again. The delinquent tax collector, the development review board, and the cemetery commission. The two who have not responded to my three emails now mm. are the listers and the zoning administrator. So I suspect they'll both be ready well, by yeah, the 14th. We'll have from that. They were working they on it. Yeah, it's but hard. they just haven't responded to my email. Just take their chairs away and tell them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then um, two but weeks later. That's worse. Yeah. They <laughs> lost their chair. Everything's some milk breaks. Yeah, right. Your second meeting in October, October 28th, everybody's confirmed, Kellogg covered, conservation, emergency management, the animal control officer, and the swim committee. Planning can be here if you need them, but, but Jared said we're level funded, we don't have any changes, and so that would be up to whether, I, I suggested to him, it'd be great if you could still be here because sometimes the select board has questions about your book budget, or they have ideas or suggestions for your budget. So it would be great if you could be here in case the select board wants to talk with you about it. And I, then at that point, when he was kind of going, if I really got to be there, so I turned him over to Kari. I said you're going to be here anyway. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. It's just take a few minutes to talk about how's it going. Yeah, I, I think that they, that's the, I'm leaning towards making sure that as I, I like you, you remarked, and uh, particularly with the kind of continued dialogue with the DRB, it'd be nice to see if maybe we want to at least use that opportunity to just kind of cover how are things going. Yeah. And, you know, what what do you want to be doing for next year? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the last group was the first meeting in November, November 11th, and on this slate I had energy, <laughs> historic preservation, and and trails. Trails uh, is confirmed, but they said they're not going to ask for any money, so I don't know if they need to be here or not. Um, Historic Preservation said that they work completely off of grants and they're not impacted by the town budget. They're not going to make a request because they get everything refunded, funded back by grants, so they don't probably need to be here. And Energy, I got a weird response back which said, we no longer have an energy committee. Well, yeah, Which, we, we don't. We've never really formally formed one. Not right, but there is a, there has been an inter energy committee. It just hasn't been select board appointed. So I didn't know what his response meant that we have no energy committee. I, th I think they're ceasing to work on anything but supporting window dressers. Yeah. That's my understanding. I they're see. not meeting anymore. They're not taking on new projects. Yeah. What, what I don't know is if that's the way the rest of the people that you're taking <laughs> the fail or not. So I, I we'll talk about that offline. So at the moment, we have basically nobody scheduled for early November because Historic Preservation said they don't need to come, Trails said they don't need to come, and Energy said they don't need to come. Hmm. Um, well, let's leave them on there anyway, and I guess we can decide if we want to try to bring them Yeah, I think we will, uh, for more of a we, we will want the time to yeah. discuss budget, whether we have guests or not. Yeah. The, the other thing is Highway Department, and right. I think I, I'd sort of like to go with an early draft at the next meeting. Okay. And just start talking about it, because it's obviously going to be a huge portion of the budget. So and, and it's too early. That, that meeting would be too early to start looking at some of the external uh, emergency services, right? Yeah. It, it right. By a month. Uh, although I got an e email from Albert, my fire chief, saying he would like to come on the 14th and make a proposal to purchase a new ambulance. Okay. That's outside of their normal, you know, annual request. Okay. But not bring the operating budget? That, well, of course, you can't do that until they have the meeting and it's all Right. This is more of an emergency yeah. situation. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Yeah. You need an ambulance. Uh, he, was, he didn't give a lot of detail. But yes, I don't, we're not we're not scheduled to hear from the fire departments until December. December. Okay. All 
right? Uh, well, I'd say let's leave it at that for now, and we'll keep that time earmarked, I think, um, and, and if we start moving through some of the other conversations, we either want to use it for ourselves or, or maybe want to try to see if we can't pull emergency services forward, um, then maybe we'll, we'll do that. Either way, we'll, we'll allocate that time in the November um, meetings for, for our own, own review. Yeah. Okay, great. great. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, and then the last agenda item. No, um, it's no. no. <laughs> no. Several more. Oh no! Wow. That's no. <laughs> <clears throat> the last agenda item on this page <laughs> of the agenda uh, is the uh, ordinance advisory committee, uh, and uh, we started this conversation uh, at our last meeting. Um, we. Uh, uh, have gone through some um, more uh, revisions on uh, some structural changes to uh, the specific charge uh, that we're going to propose for the forming of this, um, as well as some language around uh, 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 recruitment for uh, for the committee. So, uh, has everyone had the chance to review uh, the? The charge before we kind of dive into that conversation. Um, so again, for uh, for more context, uh, you know, for the for the public, uh, the the premise here is that um, uh, we, as a select board, are are interested in uh, standing up a ordinance advisory committee um, that will. Uh, that will take a, a directed approach uh, to looking at and reviewing uh, ordinances that are on the books and uh, uh, taking into consideration updates or revisions to those um, in kind of a systematic way. Um, since the select board agendas tend to be fairly full, um, and you know whether we try to do them ourselves or delegate them to subcommittees, uh, it's problematic on a number of levels. And so we were uh, thinking that having an ordinance committee uh, that would be an advisory committee uh, that has representation, standing representation of select board members uh, or member, uh, depending on the size that we kind of end up with, um, uh, as well as a uh, standing representative from, uh, from the town office. At this point, we're leaning towards the town clerk uh, relative to the town clerk's role in records keeping and, and ordinance uh, uh, review and enforcement. Um, uh, so that, that's where we kind of left it. Um, and then uh, the remaining decisions are uh, how, how many more uh, community members, uh, what's the final size that we think that this ordinance committee is going to be. Um, and, and having a conversation about um, the first set of ordinances that they'd be uh, they'd be reviewing, um, and then uh, making the decision to solicit for it. So, um, does anybody have any questions? Probably not within this group because we've talked about it. But are there any questions from from the public about <laughs> about the ordinance committee? So just for the record, uh, as it's been uh, currently charged, uh, the first slate of ordinance for, uh, ordinances for review are uh, kind of a soft start, uh, but things that we know um, are, are needed and outstanding for review, uh, which are the uh, Curtis, Curtis Pond uh, Island Ordinance, uh, the Curtis Pond Recreational uh, Area Ordinance, the uh, Dog Ordinance as well, uh, as the uh, use of the town right of way, uh, which is a work in the right of way uh, ordinance. Uh, so that is kind of the initial slate of ordinances to look at, uh, with a huge caveat being that um, once we work through that initial slate of recommended changes from the advisory committee, um, the review of the road-related ordinances would be next up because there are a handful of, of policies and ordinances that, uh, that interplay there. And, and frankly, I think they need some, some good dialogue. Um, and, and I think this committee would be able to work through that. Um, so we're getting them 
started on some of the easier ones, I guess. Uh, and, and then the next ones up would be uh, the road-related uh, ordinances, in, including our road standards, uh, which we modified slightly just to be in compliance with the state relative to stormwater uh, runoff, but it has some other things that need to be taken, to, taken into consideration. And the uh, highway ordinance with the speed limits? The highway ordinance with the speed limits uh, would be right at, the, right at the top for that one as well. Uh, to, Take into consideration the traffic studies, and then, and then I believe we're we're going to have to probably lump the curb cut in there uh, as well, um, which are all uh, due for consideration. And frankly, I think a lot of those have to be kind of taken a look at at the same time. Um, oh, and uh, maintenance. Uh, so right now we have two separate. We have a we have a road maintenance application. I don't know that we really have a oh, private, maintenance. Yeah. You know, private maintenance, so I guess that would probably be rolled up into a more comprehensive use of town hi highway yeah. right of way yeah. um, with just a more specific application. There's a lot of work to do. Yeah, so that would that would probably be up in the front front then for that particular one. So, <clears throat> are there any changes uh, to the? Uh, to the charge that has been kind of uh, consolidated by by Tegan in preparation for uh, for making a call for applicants. I think it's You're talking about the recruiting posting now. Mm. No, the charge. The charge. The, the charge. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm just checking. Yeah. Just trying to do it all at once. No. The, the charge specifically. I've never written a charge, so no hard no, feelings. I'm sorry. Lots I'm of changes. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the, the big question is uh, how large do we think this need uh, this group needs to be? Um, and I'd like to see who applies. Okay. We'll figure it out. Okay. If we only get one applicant, we'll have to <laughs> fill in. If we get, yeah. Can we? Form the committee without uh, without having a specific size. So can we uh, can we vote to, to form the committee, or can we just? It was your thought that we put out a solicitation for yeah. uh, for applications and then form the committee? Yeah, I mean, uh, because yeah. Okay. It was. So the draft recruitment that I, I drafted was written as if the committee had not yet been formed, saying that select board would like to form this committee. And then we put a suggested number of people. Okay. Which was three to five. Three to five. Yeah. Citizens. Citizens, in addition to the two select board, a town office, yeah. All right. That would give us an even number of people. So. That seems Pardon appropriate. Me? You put out the notice, you say we're planning to form a committee and let us know if you want to join, right? So, right. so, there, so there's two different things. There's the charge that Ann drafted, which I guess T and then worked on, and then there's a going out public recruitment. So if we're recruiting three to five people from the public, wouldn't that give us an even number of people? I, personally, I don't care. Um, what do you mean? Just for voting purposes, just, most uh, groups are odd numbers. These groups always work by consensus anyway, but okay. um, if, I, if it's, it's fine with me. I just wanted to point it out because it's a If it's a concern, we can just balance it with staff and or select board members to make an odd number. Okay. Once well, we we're, we're not uh, stating how many will be appointed. Right. We're looking to see how many we want to bring in, and then once they decide who gets appointed, if they want to appoint an odd number, that's yeah. what they'll do. Also, I, you know, I don't know that they'll be, uh, it's not going to be conducting business. So they're going to be rec making recommendations to to the board. So they, they are not going to serve in, in the same voting roles as the DRB or the, uh, or the planning commission. So their, their need for a quorum to conduct business is, is likely not applicable. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, they can always say, you know, if three of us thought this way, three of us thought that yeah. way. Yeah. There's an issue. Yeah, we have other committees that have even numbers. 
Okay, we yeah. can move on from okay. the um, So if, if we're comfortable with the, those concepts, then uh, then I think we just need to make a decision and to post uh, for for this. Um, if, if, are you moving now to the... Um, the announcement, I, yeah. I, I would like to make a suggestion, okay. uh, which is to remove the last three paragraphs before how to apply, and just say, if you would like to see the charge to the committee, go on the website. Just because we need to make it shorter. Mm -hmm. And that's just copied from the charge, basically, anyway. Uh, that sounds good. I think, uh, can we then so change out, so The select board has identified four ordinances and will turn its attention to road issues. Yes. I think maybe keep the paragraph about following the provisions of state open meeting law. In the recruitment? Is it necessary to say that? I don't think well, so. no. I think it should say these are going to be public meetings somewhere. Okay. It's not like a secret committee. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to hold public meetings. I think that should be said. So I mean the charter has been adopted? Uh, no, so that's, I think that I would probably list it on the website as a uh, draft, draft uh, charge or charter okay. um, and uh, and link that and then put it on the website and, and then link from the front porch forum posts um, and, and other uh, posts just to, to that. Does that sound okay. pretty reasonable? Yeah. Okay. That would make it shorter. I forget, does this have a timeline for responding? Right. Do we want to give people two weeks, three weeks? We well, had so October 10th in the how to apply. So the October 10th would give them, that would give us time to put everything in the folder. And I guess we have, that's three weeks between now and our next meeting. Yep. Uh, so I guess at that point we could probably make a decision to form the committee, but probably not make decisions on on specific appointments unless we wanted to take up appointing the standing members who, who we already know are, are going to be one or two select board members and, uh, and, and the town clerk, but then give us the opportunity to review applications or discuss applications. Applicants? Would applicants come and talk to the select board? I think that would be the most appropriate for we sure. Could do that. Yeah. We could do that on the 14th. So that right? could be on the 14th. On the 14th. On the 14th. Yeah. All right, sounds like a plan. Um, so do we want to add uh, some verbiage in there uh, to say have your application in and then or your letter of interest in with the qualifications and then plan yeah, to attend on, plan the to attend on the 14th? Yeah. Great. So are you, are you guys going to vote on this or it's just a discussion you can I don't think there's anything to necessarily vote on. Okay, I think so I just want to make sure I understand. So for the front board forum recruitment and full board recruitment, I'm deleting two paragraphs, not three. We're, we're deleting, you're deleting three, but adding somewhere in there something about these meetings will be conducted in public. Okay. Okay. Did you have I, an idea where Chris? I, I thought Christy wanted the paragraph about the public meetings. I did, and then oh, I changed my mind, mm -hmm. and I said, we just need to be clear that there'll be public meetings. Yeah. I don't think that the recruitment notice has to go through all of the, yeah. um, all of the detail in that paragraph. Okay. That will be in the charge, right? Correct. Yes. That, that's all wording that is in the charge, yeah. Can there be okay, a... okay, so the public meeting's going to be in the charge that's going on the website. It doesn't need to be mentioned in the recruitment. Can there be a link in the recruitment yeah. Uh, to yeah. the website? To yes, the yeah, I'll put a, a link in the recruitment yeah. notice to the, the charge, but you're saying completely delete those three paragraphs, and I don't need to make a reference to public meetings. Well, I think Chris wanted a, a sentence in there somewhere that said it made a reference to all meetings will be conducted in public. Okay, I got it. Can, what is the difference between the charge and the resolution that I drafted? Like, what is a charge supposed to be? Oh, I don't know. 
I did, I, that resolution caught me by surprise. Why do we have to have a resolution? Most of the time when select boards formally create a committee, they have a resolution. It's in their minutes and it's a... We, we didn't do that when we formed the Emergency Management Committee. I would, be, I would be a bad practice to start, and especially for this particular one that's going to be relative to ordinances. Um, so I think <laughs> it's good to have a founding document that yeah. can be referenced. Has been doing training. I know. <laughs> <laughs> she seems to be making a recommendation for best practices, and I think it's, if it's, I'm interpreting the message, it's probably. nice to have a document to go back to when you're wondering about the history of a committee or commit. Oh. To have this very simple, very straightforward, this is what we did and why we did it under these circumstances. Well, and so I think uh, I think both are still probably uh, uh, appropriate. So we yeah. should be prepared to uh, adopt the resolution. Um, uh, and then the charge is what's going to set the work for the initial priorities. Yeah. And the intention of this committee is that their priorities are going to be very very deliberately set um, by the by the select board. So I think both in this particular um, instance are, are appropriate. Uh, Makes sense. For the next meeting, not tonight. No, for the next meeting, we <laughs> okay. prepare. Because I think you need to adopt a resolution. Like that notion. Yeah, and then also uh, adopt the initial charge of, of priorities. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe the charge gets shorter a little bit. Okay. Are we comfortable moving on? Can I just confirm? So you're looking for Tina to post the charge on the website like tomorrow, right? So, the, so this post can get out tomorrow. And probably the resolution, I think. Can they be in the same spot? I think so, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And then and they'll, be, they'll be drafts. And they'll, they'll be proposed yeah, or draft. Proposed or draft, however, mm -hmm. however we'd okay. like to. I like propose. I don't, I don't. I don't think we need to discuss too many more changes to these. We've already. No. We've already hammered those out. Yeah. So. Okay. Moving uh, to the social services appropriations committee. <clears throat> which Kari, I believe you've done some homework on how or mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Actually, uh, Jamie sent me an email that night. She found an email from oh. Judy Roberts when she was appointed to the committee. And it said who was on the committee and that they were meeting one time to review the letters. And that was my memory, too. When I was on it, we met one time and we reviewed the letters. and. And then we um, just chose somebody to go tell the select board okay. what we had decided. So this um, uh, memo that we have. That's from me. That's from you. Thank so you. It doesn't say that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's a combination of what Jamie told me and my memory of how it all worked. And um, since then, of course, the open meeting law has become the standard, so it really needs to be conducted in the format of an open meeting, so that changes it a little bit. It was just kind of the same group got together once a year and had some Christmas cookies and <laughs> read the letters and made a recommendation. And it still may be that. Well, yeah, so it, I mean, Just publicly warned. The cookies are not banned. <laughs> uh, but this is this had kind of come up in the conversation as well with the, with the Energy Committee as well, and it, it, considering how we might want to structure uh, structure a, a committee um, and whether or not it made, made sense relative to the scope of work to make it an advisory advisory board which would come with the same requirements and oh boy yeah I guess so <laughs> it makes the appointments a little easier as well I believe uh, because they're they're not as Structured so that they don't have to be on on a on a rolling appointment. You can have standing committee members or advisory board members. But it sounds like they're making. Does this this still includes the scope of of the public services that are going to be recommended to 
That's the whole purpose, right, is to evade process. Yeah. So yeah. that at town meeting we can say, someone has looked at these. Yeah. It's not a heavy lift. No, it's just a lot of, it's just a lot of <laughs> appointed positions. Mm. Yeah, but it's an hour once a year. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Yes, sir. I, I think I mentioned this before, but one of the things that the committee was charged with in the past was finding out how many people in Callis are served by the organization and whether or not any members of Callis serve on their boards. Um, mm -hmm. Because they, they felt like that would be of interest. Um, you know, to the town, like if just some organization that nobody receives the services in Calais, and yet they're asking money from the town. So that was always part of it, too. But, but Barbara, don't you put that in the letter when you send it out? To you put, it goes in their initial application that they do when they first get on there, but if they come back the next year, they don't have to do that. They just say, yes, we would like to ask for the same amount again. And the only thing they have to tell us is if they've dramatically changed their dollar amount they're requesting. Mm -hmm. Chris, did you have a question? What's the charge of this group? I mean, the, the title for me talks about social services, working with Washington County Mental Health. The list that we vote on in the budget, we take, pull it out and we budget, we vote on it every year. It's 500 for this group and 250 yep, yep, for this group. Yep. It's that so, list. Oh, it's just looking at that list. Yeah. But at the at the town meeting this past year there were right. folks that said we wanna have make sure there's some citizen input. Right. Vetting the list. Yeah. Yeah. So for instance, when Jim was here and talked about how much money we give to the library. Yeah. Yes. But in the case, in the library's about the only one that comes in separately. The rest of them just send letters. Well, and the library is actually on the warning. It's a separate it's article a separate on the warning, yeah, whereas all right. these other 20 organizations mm -hmm. So Washington County Mental Health getting yes. $1,400 or $1,500 yeah. or whatever they get. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there would be, yeah, a, yeah. There would be establish a committee for reviewing it, and, and I guess it sounds like you know, adding, a, adding a layer of review that, that that takes into consideration um, how, how those resources are being directed to the service and community members in Calais, I guess. Um, um, so it, it, it sounds to me like <clears throat> this, well, in, in addition, Chris, it's that there have been some regular requests for establishing something, something like that. Um, uh, that is a lingering to do. So, uh, do we we need a resolution, probably? Uh, to I don't adopt. know that we need one for something like this. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you can, if you want to draft one, Jordan, mm -hmm. I wouldn't take that away from you. Okay. <laughs> I don't mind the idea of a resolution. <laughs> uh, so, I'd be happy to kind of take what Anna's proposed. Or pull, you know, what not Dan's proposed, but what you've oh, okay. brought up and, and okay. try to form a resolution out of that. Cool. And then we can adopt, consider adopting it uh, for the next meeting. I can also draft a resolution. If you want to I'm happy to do it too. Okay. I mean, I used to do it for a living. Yeah. <laughs> I used to write resolutions. It's pretty easy. I mean, I've done a couple, a couple of hundred. <laughs> So we'll look at a resolution next time and then figure out the process for selecting people from there. Appointments? Yeah, I think so. Unless we have to prioritize the ordinance committee and then we I think so. And the end of the DRB. Yeah. So we're going to, I think that I'll revisit uh, the list that um, that we'll had circulated so that we can we can get a post out for uh, for the DRB as well. Oh, right. right. And see yeah. if we can yeah. solicit some. Some initial applicants for the DRB. Do we think we want that same timeline? We might interview DRB applicants on the first. I'm sure the DRB would really appreciate it if we do, but I mean, it, it sounds like that's going to really make for a long October 13th. Um, or 14th. <laughs> My <laughs> start <with it>. Sorry, <laughs> um, So I'm, I'm open to some feedback on that. Um, <clears throat> that those are. Yeah, it takes a while to interview people. Well, 
let's I guess see what the applications are. We see what the applications are. And then, then we can we have go plenty over of time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But for this, can I just ask yeah. for the social yeah. services committee, Barbara, what's the timing? When do those letters start coming in? Uh, I've already gotten six. You've already gotten some. Yeah, because the application's been on the website all year. Right, right, right. It's I'm just thinking, I mean, to avoid doing everything all at once, we could do it closer to whenever you are going to need the list for uh, printing it up ahead of town meeting. The, the, the only problem is just people's schedules during the holidays. So once you get through October, and then it's the yeah, dates sure get made and so forth, it's, the it's, it's hard to get people together okay. to, cut, to okay. convene and meet. All right. I was hoping we could defer this one, but... And, and we probably could defer one meeting, maybe. Mm. Okay. It's just going to get rid of the tight. I have a question. Yes. That made me think of what gets printed in the book, the amount that they did request, or after the committee meets, they make a recommendation, or what they ask for gets goes What's in the book. What's been being printed in the book is what they asked for, because we didn't have a committee. Okay. But what I think I heard Anne say was that once the committee meets and makes a recommendation to the select board, we put in the town report what the select board approves to go on there. So that means the printing deadline is January, which means that committee would need to meet with the Christmas before cookies. January. With Christmas yes. cookies. Before their sale. Or champagne on January yeah, 2nd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and are we, yeah, and I mean, we don't need to do this tonight, but it, we could also, the committee could also like change the recommended amount, or you know, if it's a committee mm -hmm. that's making mm -hmm. a recommendation. So, well, that's what I was going to ask. Are they just there to gather information and be prepared to talk about things, or they would actually recommend changes before the printing of the town report? I was never. I, I never, never did they make changes when I was there, but yes, right. that could be one of the okay. things that they decide. Yeah, usually they report at town meeting day, they, you know, this is the slate, and we recommend, you know, this one only gets this much because nobody in Callis is served or whatever. Okay. Um, or we knock 25 bucks off of each, yeah, each, yeah. Re each request yeah. because it was so much or something. Yeah. Or somebody asked for a huge increase but couldn't justify one. Right. Okay. So we're not next meeting then? Resolution next meeting. Resolution next meeting. But, uh, okay. We'll try to find applications. We'll consider applications later later in the year. Um, <clears throat> Curtis Pond Dam Rehabilitation Project. Yeah, so quickly, the uh, last Monday we did the first large concrete pour. They went very well, 18 trucks, concrete trucks. And so that's actually a combination of two, two pours, and uh, the next one will be next Monday. And um, so we're on our way. We, we have just today applied for an extension timeline extension to be able to continue working into November 1st. Mm -hmm. And money-wise, we've spent, we're right around 50%. We've spent a little a little under 50% on our construction budget, but a little over 50% overall. Um, I just requisitioned the final portion of, the, of our bond loan. So now we're just gonna be drawing on our funds after this. Although tonight we need to accept the $100,000 donation from the CPA. And then there will be one more donation to cover what's remaining. We'll wait as long as we can to figure out what that amount is. So okay. they're pouring the concrete. Once it's set, they take down the forms, and then do yep. they take out the coffer dam? Uh, well, the coffer dam will be near the end. So, so they've done the base of one half, and they're going to do the base of the other half oh. next Monday. And then they're going to actually bring in subcontractors to do the upper part because it's got angles. It's okay. not what Hebert does. So. <laughs> yeah, they bring me in the angle people. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, but they, it sits for, I forget how long, 10 days. Depends on how warm it is, I think, I think it is, and then they remove the forms. But the copper dam will be in place until, I think, uh, mid-October. Try to imagine how you take the copper dam apart without 
shooting all the water through it and sending all those bags of sand helter skelter. No. It'll be fun. So he's done it before. <laughs> uh, they seem to enjoy their work. Yeah, yeah. that's good. <laughs> Slowly. Yeah. Slowly. Yeah. Careful. Uh, I, I received a, a related, or not related to anything so far, but a, a dam related inquiry um, about um, uh, about the riprap removal um, on the downstream side of the old dam, and Larry's charged with taking that away. But I can't remember where we landed on what's happening with it. Oh, really? Uh, it, right now, um, he's going to take it away. If, if there are alternative uses for it, it'll save us money if we if he doesn't have to haul it to. Well, so that's the thing. That, I mean, that was now funding that we've likely been paid back for through FEMA money, right? So that was stuff that we're not. No, it's a it's a budget item, you know. No, 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 no. The the original placement of it. So those stones no. are ideally ours to use if we yes. can find a way to. Us. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering if there might be a temporary storage arrangement that could be made down the road. Um, we so looked at, could they go to the garage? And no one was too excited about There's that. There's a property over there. Yeah. 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 I was thinking I about property the on the property. There's a lot of there. Yeah, the <laughs> gentleman that Red Bradley's house. Yeah. Put him in front of Lily's house, right off the edge of the road. Please. Boom to the East Cows Dam. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it was a, it was a. Certainly, we've agreed to pay for having them uh, removed, but it, at the moment, there it's it's our material that FEMA paid for, and if we can find a way to keep it in town. Um, originally, we were thinking that like there could be some sort of barter for its value to reduce costs, but that's um, understandably hard for uh, the contractor well, to commit to, but. If we can find a way to store that in town. Uh, I believe we have time because I don't think he's going to remove it till the spring. Okay. There's a few last items like the landscaping part of it that right. we don't till the spring. Okay. And well, I think that we'll have this, my continue to have time to discuss maybe what's happening on the county road then. Yeah. Mm. Yet another cost. Rip wrap storage. I'll put it on rip wrap storage. <laughs> <laughs> no extra permitting needed. That's right. Uh, great. Well, Grind thank you. Up and make them into gravel. I just wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> I no. I mean, I think part of the problem with that stuff is that it's it's really hard on trucks to transport, um, and uh, so finding somebody to transport it and then finding somebody who's willing to sell it to you when you need it um, is is hard. So having a local source of it um, could be could be nice as we're looking at culvert. Mm -hmm. Reconstruction projects, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. um, and it was a it was a valid inquiry that was raised. So I was just trying to keep that top of mind. Um, that's all I have though for for that. Other than uh, needing to have a conversation about, I guess, accepting a donation. So do we need to approve the acceptance of it um, or authorize an individual? I guess to approve. Either one. No, I think it's just a motion to so approve. It's the CPA. Yeah, and their source was just donations. donations. This is a loan. No, this is the loan. Oh, this is the loan. And we wanted to delay it yeah. to, until we needed it. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. CPA Curtis sponsors. So they've called it a loan. I didn't realize that. Okay. Well, there is a loan. It's different from the donations. I know. Right. Yeah, they're donating this money they borrowed. To the town. Yeah. Correct. So yeah, either one. So it's just a motion to accept the donation from the Curtis Pond Association for the amount of a thousand dollars, which is a hundred thousand dollars. A lot of travel. A lot of travel. A hundred thousand dollars to uh, be used for the purpose of. Uh, uh, paying expenses uh, related yeah, to the Curtis uh, Curtis Pond Dam Rehabilitation Project. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? 
Thank you, Curtis Pond Dam Association. <coughs> ah, excuse me. And uh, moving on to reports. Uh, um, you, sorry. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't. I, I want to go back. I'm sorry about this. But speaking of a lot of travel, I have that we skipped over approving the board orders. Did we skip over that by mistake at the very beginning? No. no, 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 no. Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry. Thanks for checking. <laughs> Thanks for checking. <laughs> I was like, wait, we didn't do that. We have it, was, it was very quick. We have not signed Okay, it was very quick. Yeah, it was very yeah, quick. Yeah, it was very quick. Tegan, did you have any, any reports? I mean, I went to the Clerks and Treasurers Conference. It was great. I had a wonderful time. I learned a lot. I took a boatload of notes. I haven't even started bar bothering Barbara with half of them yet. Uh, also looking forward to town fair. Chris and Kari and I are going on October 2nd, the LCT's big day. That should be also very informative, very helpful. Um, town office has been lots of tax bills, uh, lots of notarizations, lots of, lots of calls about ballots since the election's coming. Everyone is suddenly asking about their ballots, and so we're fielding a lot of calls about that. And I mailed out the first ballots today to international folks and some other things. So election stuff is cranking. We're going to get the election notebooks out in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, nice, busy pace. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Kari? So uh, tax collection season is going well, and I want to give Barbara a big appreciation. Barbara is single-handedly <laughs> millions of dollars. Millions. Millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. So, um, and our coffers are pretty full at the moment, but we are gonna owe the school district a very large payment in 20 days. So the next time we meet, you'll see that. Um, there's financial reports in, in the, uh, it's still early on, it's a little hard to say exactly mm -hmm. that there's trends. One thing to have note is our chloride budget is, we're way, well over budget and um, Hmm. I'm not exactly sure why that is. And what line item? Chloride. Oh, chloride. Um, it's five thousand dollars a shipment, and we've just been applying it um, very steadily in the past um, six weeks or so. But it's it's really important when when it's super uh, dry. It's been yeah, really yeah, super dry, dry for yeah, this last summer for sure. Fire danger is high. No burn permits. Mm. <laughs> just saying. Um, the crew is busy completing the grant and aid work. We have until the 30th, and once that's complete, we'll submit for reimbursement. That'll be a pretty significant reimbursement that we'll be getting from the state for that. Unclear when we're going to see more FEMA money. Um, we did. We were assigned our FEMA coordinator, the same person that we've been working with, so that's great. Um, and it's just been a pretty intense period of time. The one curveball that was mentioned earlier is the MERP grant. So originally when we were, so remember this is a multi-stage process and we have the implementation and we had two assessments done, one for this building, one for the office. The renovated parts don't need really anything. Um, these buildings are very tight, but the, we, you know, we were always very clear that we were hoping that we could get some energy improvements to the upstairs of this building. And initially, we were told that the criteria for selecting which towns would be eligible is this computation of, uh, of energy, energy burden in town. I don't, I don't really understand what that is. I don't know really looked into it. But initially, Calus did not qualify for whatever the benchmark was. But then last week, uh, at the beginning of the week, we were told, oh, anybody can apply for this grant. And the applications do this Thursday. Mm -hmm. So we've just been scrambling to pull this together. Um, I got I got numbers from John McCullough has been really helpful um, because it doesn't have to be super detailed. It's rough estimates. And we, what we want to do is basically finish off the upstairs of this. So building envelope would be insulation in the walls and in the in, in the attic, and then. Um, connecting to the existing heating system. It's all stubbed up and ready to go. We'll need to rewire. You know, there, there's the, the application's at about $105,000 right now for everything. Um, and I'm gonna meet with Sam Lash. Remember Sam Lash? I'm meeting with her tomorrow, because um, she's a real dynamo. She just 
wants, to, wants us to get the money and, and, and it's going to go through the application with us and hopefully give us some pointers. But we'll get that in. So anyway, it's a pretty straightforward thing, but it's just like so rushed. Um, Thanks for doing it. Yeah, 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 so fingers crossed on that. Um, that. That's really all I've got. I think so. That somehow, if we got that, we can figure out a way to use it to also dampen the sound. <laughs> Do something to the ceiling. Oh. I couldn't quite figure out how to make it work. Up, up there? Well, no, the sound in here. Here. So, thank you for bringing that up. So, I did more research on insulating panels and so forth. And when I talked to John McCullough about it, he said, it's fine. It's all fixed. We've taken care of it. And I said, I still hear echo and reverb in here and find it hard to understand. And he said, nothing else can be done. So I'd like the select board's feedback on that. Would you like more acoustical work to be done in here? Because I've done the research to find it, but I kind of got shut down by John McCullough saying nothing else needs to be done. We've handled it. Uh, I. I think feedback has to come from people who are experiencing the yeah, problem. Yeah. Because uh, if you're not, I mean, to me it sounds fine. So I need to hear it from, you know, how many people are bothered by it right now. Anyway, I, if we had lots of money to spend, I'd put in one of those ceilings that, that absorb the sound. But I doubt we can consider call that insulation. Barbara's looked into other options already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> there are a couple of different solutions. There are like wood panels that you can get that are more geometric in shape. And I wonder if you could just get them in a certain, where the voices are coming from uh, for the majority as opposed to just the whole room. But She um, found a less expensive wall type. Yeah, yeah it's a, just a, a very dense foam that you could just cover with the fabric. So. If that's something that the select board is open to, I'm happy to present it when you come meet with her to do an agenda planning or something and get some figures and turn it into Tegan for fiscal year 26 budget. That sounds good. Let's let's go with that. Okay. Uh, uh, let's take a look at those options okay. uh, at the next agenda planning um, and find a time to work it into the schedule. So we'll get a real sense of the acoustics on October the 4th. <laughs> we have our town meet and greet to see how, because I know, I remember last year's meet and greet. It was hard to understand. Yeah. That's right, it was. With, with yeah. 40 people in here. It wasn't even 30, yeah. maybe 30 people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you're saying it sounds fine to you. It does. Who, are, who do you want me to check with? Just, like, I know Larry Bush. Yeah, if, still, if you want to check in with some of the other committees that meet in here, I think that would still be. Okay, check with the committees. Yeah, another one who's yeah. mentioned. It's very hard for her. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, as far as the uh, shed decals, I don't have much to report right now, uh, unless anybody has any specific questions. I think we haven't heard from the court yet. Uh, we report, is that right? <clears throat> so we uh, filed a motion for uh, judgment, um, and uh, it, there was not a formal response uh, submitted uh, by the other party. Um, so we have now also uh, proposed a judgment uh, to the court and have not heard from it. Do uh, you anticipate to hear from them either uh, this week or next? Um, so. I imagine we may have uh, more to take into consideration um, by the October term. Optimistic, I guess. But that's all I've got so far. Um, oh, one item of note is Will it deliver the, um, the decision of the DRB? The town had applied for oh, additional yes. use for those stormwater projects and they approved. approved. Um, did they put any conditions on it other than? I don't, I don't think so. I haven't really read it. What did the town apply for a permit for? A conditional use permit um, for the um, construction of observation. Yeah. Those, those stormwater projects over in East Dallas. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Thanks. Uh, with that, I'd uh, a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. Oh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
Thank you. That was fun. That was. <laughs>